Good afternoon. I am going to call to order the July 10, 2023 school committee meeting. Um, just going to read this meeting, this uh, statement quickly. This meeting is being held in person and or remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023 and all other applicable laws temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. We have Harbor Media recording tonight and we are recording on Zoom. Is there anyone else um, recording? either in the audience here or online, if you don't mind throwing your hand up if you are recording. Okay, I see none. All right, so moving on to item two, we have some um, minutes to approve. So I will take a motion and if somebody wants to make them. Those are for you, Madam Chair. Um, I will make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on June 12th, 2023. Here's second. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Um, second, sir. I will make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on June 26, 2023. Any second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right, so item three. Um, so this is the part of the meeting where we allow for up to 15 minutes um, for comments or questions on things that do not appear on the agenda tonight. Um, so our practice is to take the, the uh, questions and comments on um, new business items, but if you had something other than that, if you could raise your hand or um, so that I could recognize you, if that's the case, I will read the statement, otherwise I will move on. Is there anyone here who would like to speak? Okay, all right, so moving on to item four, um, which is the superintendent's report. And I will pass it over to Dr. Adams. So in the, um, under the superintendent's report, um, we included a personnel report. Um, this is from the period of June 1st to last Friday, July 7th. Um, we, in the past, had been consistently giving these reports on a monthly or bi-monthly a quarterly basis. Um, we're instituting them again and hope to share them on a monthly basis going forward so that you have a snapshot of um, personnel action. The report includes appointments that have been made during that time, um, retirements, um, resignations, and um, transfers um, that have occurred during that period. Um, and look forward to giving you another one in August and then on a monthly basis moving forward. Um, to give you that information. So I'm, I'm grateful to Kelly Larkin, our human resource coordinator, um, and Sherry Robertson for helping with um, coordinating um, the information for that report. In addition, just to share that even though school's not in session at, we have um, ESY, our extended school year program well underway. They started their second week. Um, at, at the east is our elementary program, K through five at the middle school. Um, we have the grade six through 12 program and students are um, smiling and coming every day and getting in, starting to get into a routine. So it's great to see some students, even though we're in the middle of the summer. So thank you. Questions on the personnel? Questions? Thank you for pulling that together. That was helpful to see. Um, okay, so moving on to item five we've got communications uh 5.1 is communications received by the superintendent dr adams do you have anything no no okay um we don't have a student rep today um which is 5.2 5.3 is art other communications do we have anybody on the committee that's received anything no. um okay so item six is unfinished business we don't have any so we are just chugging along um to item seven which is lengthy um, so 7.1 is to receive an update on the social studies program review and act as appropriate. We've got Andy Doy who is here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, we're excited to see you. Likewise. All right. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. 
so I am here uh, just to provide a, a brief update on the program review process for our social studies and business departments. Uh, it's certainly been a long-standing practice in the Hingham Public Schools to formally review our curriculum and programs. Uh, I last presented a program review in the spring of 2017. I was slated to do so again in the spring of 2021. Something happened during that time. Uh, but, you know, with so many things, the pandemic threw off a lot of our regular processes, and we're now returning to the program review process this year. Um, and you might recall that uh, Katie Roberts presented to you back in the fall a new pr uh, process. And you'll see on the title page here that I'm giving a year one update. And that reflects one of those changes in the, uh, in the protocol. So oh, we can go to the next one, Sherry. That's not working. Uh, back one. Hmm. Can you try refreshing? Try refreshing the document. Go to slide four. That's it. Uh, so, as that, uh, as the protocol explains that uh, that Katie went over with you back in the fall, we've adopted this multi-year procedure rather than the single year uh, of the past. And social studies and business are now the first to go through that new prop process. So, my purpose here today is to give you an update on what we've accomplished in that first year really more to let you know what's to come next year. So you can kind of think of this as, you know, the 60 second teaser trailer for the main theatrical event next spring. Um, now you can go back to what's on there as slide two. So um, I just want to start by noting how very proud we are of our social studies program here in Hingham, which as you can see in these photos is really bolstered by our connections to the community. And that is, um, we're equally proud of what I would call kind of our small but mighty business department uh, that I also oversee. And that really offers our students a variety of real world um, experiences in business and entrepreneurship fields. And while we're very proud of those programs, at the same time, we're always looking to, to uh, make enhancements, to make improvements. And as educators, really, we're constantly reviewing what we do on a yearly, a monthly, weekly, daily, you know, um, even uh, during lessons from lesson to lesson, you know, you're always making adjustments in the moment. But this program review process really affords us the opportunity to do that on a macro level, right? To look at a more formal, systematic, big picture way. So if we now go jump ahead, Sherry, to what's probably slide five for you. Yep, there we are. Um, so this table might look familiar to you from the fall, uh, kind of visually outlining our updated program review process. We're over there on the far left in purple, and we've just finished year one in 22-23, and we'll be continuing that work in the coming school year. So in the um, part one, which is the self-study, um, that's guided by some essential questions that I'll uh, talk about momentarily. And at that first part, we're looking to um, really analyze and evaluate data, artifacts, really uh, look in a focused, systematic way at our current program. The second part, which we'll be getting into next year, is the action planning part. So that will culminate in a written report, uh, recommendations, really focusing on actions for the future to carry us through those next several years on that uh, table that you just saw, um, and a formal presentation to you all next spring. The first thing we had to do was assemble a team, and you can see we're well represented uh, K through 12. Uh, we have three um, elementary teachers, and they've taught a variety of grade levels, not just the grade level that they're assigned to currently. We have every grade level at the middle school represented, and then uh, with our high school social studies teachers, um, all of our core courses and uh, grades 9 through 11 represented, as well as some of our elective courses. We also have our two educators who teach all of our business electives in our business department. 
So I'll be looking at all of those things, social studies and business, um, together next year. So we developed some essential questions to guide um, that self-study process. Essential questions really can't be answered by a simple yes or no, right? Uh, they're open-ended, they require analysis and evaluation, and uh, especially in the study of history, we love to what extent questions, right? The study of history involves nuance, and so all of our essential questions are to what extent questions. So to what extent is our program aligned to standards and articulated vertically and horizontally? To what extent does our program foster the development of student skills? To what extent does it use best instructional practices? Does it meet the needs of all students? Does it prepare students for life? And to what extent do our programs have the necessary resources? Also, as part of uh, you know, this, this first step in the process, we conducted site visits. Now, this was actually done in anticipation of that 2021 program review. Uh, we had uh, groups of two to three educators go out to, um, to local districts to look at how they were running their social studies programs. Um, and so we've got a lot of good data from that that we're able to use. Uh, and we gathered and begun to analyze our own internal data as well. Next year, what we'll be doing uh, is to complete that process. There's still more that we want to look at, including some stakeholder surveys. We've already surveyed uh, staff, but we would like to expend, extend that to other stakeholders as well. Um, and we'd also like to get another set of eyes on our program. That was another addition to the new program review process is to have a visiting team come in. Uh, and so I'll be sending out an invitation to other areas, social studies and business educators to come and visit us here in Hingham and, and give us some of their impressions and thoughts. And then finally writing uh, that report and action plan that I mentioned previously. So that is the process in a nutshell. Um, open to any questions you might have at this time, but obviously there will be much more to come next spring. Thanks so much. Yes, I, as with the new process starting up, there's going to be bumps in the road and mm -hmm. all of that. And it's not really a question, but I just wanted to thank you for being the guinea pig and volunteering to go first. It sure. wasn't. I, I uh, might have been voluntold, but either, <laughs> either is fine. Well, either is fine. Yes. Well. <laughs> No, but in all honesty, I do. We do look forward to the process because it's it's a healthy healthy thing to do. Um, like I said, we're proud of what we do, but we always want to keep going and doing better. Thank you. I would echo just to thank Andy for doing the first run of this um, and working with the staff, and to thank also all the staff. Yes. Who's given input into the program, and it's really in the cycle of improvement, and really a teacher-led process mm -hmm. to ask the educators to think about as a department, what are the next steps? And then what's an action plan that makes sense for the department? Um, so we just commend the teachers who have been willing to participate along with the process and, and learn in, in a spirit of growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I wanna thank you for, as part of the process, kind of reaching out to other districts and, and mm -hmm. seeing what they're doing and having them come in. I think that's super valuable for probably our staff, but also for theirs too. Yes. So I think it's, it's great. I think some of the new things that have been um, added to the program too, particularly among the civics things, the mock um, town meeting was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The eighth grade program, um, bringing in the community leaders and yeah. people, that's really, really well done with those too. Yeah. 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 And appreciate the invites. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and all the Project Citizen. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, we appreciate all of your engagement in attending all those, so thank you. Anyone else? No? Right. Okay. Thank, well, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve to approve the review, or is it approve the plan? Well, the plan would be just the update. Because the, update. the plan comes at the end of the next year. Approve the, well, the, no, the approval was with the process that right. we approved in the fall. Right. right. Yes. All okay. Right. Great. So. Great. So thank you. If it needs approval, we approve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, next item on the agenda is to receive an, receive an update on the year, um, end of year ELA and math assessments. Um, so I, I see know. Mary Andrews is blocking up, so I assume she's leading us off with the ELA. I think Katie might be starting. Katie okay. might be okay. happy yeah. to. I'm actually here online, um, just uh, going to uh, Zoom in virtually. So 
Sherry was going to share the slides for us, and uh, Dave Jewett couldn't join us this evening, so I'll be presenting the map portion of the presentation. Katie, before you start, um, just want to give thanks to, when you look at the data, we're so very proud of first our students and then also our staff, and you'll see that the students um, have made great progress as a result of all the work of the staff. A lot of efforts were made to reinstitute and build upon past work on MTSS, really putting into place data meetings and looking at the data with educators and supporting educators in making um, cha um, changes to their classroom to, in order to support the, the young people. Um, so we have a lot to be proud of. In addition, there's still work to be done, and so you'll hear a little bit about some next steps going into next year, um, about some of the work that still needs to be done. Um, but we're, we're super proud and grateful of um, our educators and proud of our students as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for that uh, introduction. And um, Sherry, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, so at this point in our MTSS journey, I know our school committee and public is probably now very familiar uh, with this slide here. Um, but for those of you who are new to the conversation, um, the presentation this evening is about our multi-tiered system of supports and the data um, that we have been tracking to monitor student progress towards benchmarks this year. Uh, next slide, Sherry. And so um, this uh, end of year data presentation completes our first full year long intervention cycle under our newly restructured interven intervention protocol. Um, the primary um, uh, additions this year were some additional diagnostic data that was added and uh, again, as Dr. Adams said, a regular um, data meeting that brought together our classroom educators, special educators, and our MTSF staff and administrators um, to really have eyes on the data, um, to be um, self-reflective, and to be continually refining our practice um, as uh, we progress throughout the year. In terms of our next steps, now that we've completed this first year cycle, we have the benefit of being able to look back on this year and um, do have some thoughts on continuing uh, to refine uh, the MTSF interventions and data protocol. Um, in particular, we will be um, continuing to partner with iReady and we'll be doing some additional professional development around the use of the iReady MyPath, which is a uh, kind of that extension of the diagnostic tool um, in order uh, to help us to really make best use of that uh, personalized learning piece and to really um, even um, more targetedly um, personalize interventions. Um, as you are also aware, um, the school committee um, that received a presentation um, around um, the district-wide adoption of the new evidence-based K-5 reading program intervening and just wanted to really make that point that um, our, our, our work ahead really is around bolstering, uh, continuing to strengthen our tier one instruction, and that new intervening program is one component of that. And similarly, uh, we'll be continuing our elementary math coaching cycles that began this year uh, to continue our work around the tier one instruction in the classroom around that workshop model and math practices. Thanks, Sherry. And we will now uh, turn things over to Mary Andrews, who is there in person to present uh, the end of year ELA data. Great, thanks, Katie. Um, so first off, this is just a refresher of, despite the fact that we'll be presenting on Dibbles and uh, Acadian's Dibbles and um, iReady tonight, there are a number of other uh, screeners and assessments that we look at over the course of a year when we're considering how students are progressing through literacy. Let's practice and see if this, oh, that's exciting, it does work. Okay, so in starting to look at our K2 Acadian's Dibbles data, the first thing you might notice as opposed to the middle of the year data, I'm unable to present a comparison point from the end of year 2020 because we had a little interruption in services. Um, regardless, we'll be able to look at that, uh, that poor group we're calling our K-COVID year that came back in um, for our hybrid year, and we're seeing that they continue to make nice progress and that we have some nice remediation through their MTSS system. 
We'll also be reminded of the fact that when we look at Acadians data, that's a moving benchmark. It gets more and more difficult to hit benchmark. In addition, the subtests change as the students go through the year, so it's not an apples to apples comparison. You're not heading toward a fixed benchmark like you are in iReady. Despite those changes, uh, we still have 83% of our kindergartners at the end of the year in at or above benchmark, over 75% of our first graders, and 81-ish um, percent of our second graders in that zone where we want to be. Um, starting with our group that were second graders this year, um, we see some nice progress as that kindergarten group. That first bar there is when they were uh, kindergartners in 2021, and then first graders in the middle, same group as um, second graders, and we see a nice trajectory of growth with that cohort. And we know there are different ways to look at data, and they're all valuable, um, but it, it's always interesting, like we did with the MCAS data, when you can really look at how a particular cohort does, because ends change and cohorts change, right? Um, so that said, we have, uh, this is just a look at kindergarten for the past three years. This is as far back as our um, Dibbles database goes, so this is, this is what we can look at. Um, and again, I put the ends in there just as sort of a point of information at the bottom, um, but we, we see um, a solid trajectory there for our K years. Again, and that's with a moving cohort, so it, it becomes a little bit different, but um, we, we see what we want to see, more blue and green, um, less yellow and red. Our first grade for the past three years, end of year data. These are the composite scores the, the, of all the Dibble subtests computed together um, for each grade level. So these are our first grade scores that are um, heading in a direction that we like to see. We would like to see those first grade scores in the 80% range at least like the other grades. So um, there's definitely some work to do there. Um, and then, you know, we can look at this one and have a little, oh, everything's falling apart because look what happened last year to this year. Remember, though, this second grade is that same cohort that I just showed you when we looked just at them. That was the, that last bar is that, that COVID cohort. And when we looked at just them on their own. Um, so there, there's, you know, certainly interesting data to look at here, too. Um, but the big picture also includes the end that we had was only 184. If you recall from the middle of the year in 2021, we didn't have enough staff on the team at South in order to do the one teeny tiny retail test to all second graders, but that obliterates a composite score. And then that end moves up to 301 and um, back down to 262. So that's where our second graders are. Um, that was our, that's our big banner reminder. Don't forget the benchmarks change. Um, so don't have a heart attack when you look at that. Uh, grid of the, this is just our kindergarten this year from the beginning of the year to the end of the year until the end of the year. We can see had anyone scored a 38, which had put them in the blue at the beginning of the year. If you scored a 38 at the end of the year, you would be solidly in the red zone. So it's a good sort of reminder of how those benchmarks grow. Um, and we still do see some growth there, regardless of those moves. Uh, this is a good, I think, visual of how even the subtests themselves aren't consistent through the course of the year. Quite honestly, the easier ones, once they know that students would all be getting first sound fluency, Acadian says, we don't need to check that anymore. So now we have phoneme seg and nonsense word fluency for correct letter sound. So those become more sophisticated too. Um, first grade. This is our first grade this year from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Again, with those benchmarks growing as, as they go through the school year, our average scores continue to be above benchmark in both sets. Again, this is how things shake out with our subtests for grade one and how those change over the course of the year, what gets dropped, what gets added. And grade two, beginning of the year till the end of the year, um, again with those those benchmarks so great k uh, one and two are the we're testing all kids in all schools all the time for these same subtests and since we have had our full robust team in place for the past two years every school every grade has had all what we've needed them to have to get the composite score to compare for you and these are our subtests for grade two that's how that shakes out um I ready. We know that we don't have that longitudinal data to look at because this is our second year with reading, um, and um, we're using it a little bit differently, which I'll 
speak to in a minute at the middle school. Um, in a nutshell, we've seen really nice growth across the board. Um, from We moved from 73 to 94% in that on or above grade level um, in third grade, 63 to 84 in fourth grade, 66 to 82. Um, and those are that's the all grades all together. Um, we'll also see that for students considered as a whole at each grade have made really great um, typical annual growth. They've exceeded our expectations both when we look at them as a whole, but also when we look um, at the special education cohorts in each grade level too, have made some really nice growth. These are those growth scores, that progress toward annual growth, which you know you hope to approach and meet 100, and so that those are really, really nice indicators of how the students have grown. Um, and these are our special education cohorts in those three grades. Uh, name of the game with iReady is you want to see the green go up and you want to see the red go down. Um, it's nice to see the yellow go down too. Sometimes the yellow is a little less distinct because it's the pathway from red to green. So if you have a lot in red and they're moving on their way up to green, the yellow can increase. But for the most part, um, we can certainly see that we're seeing what we, and that, um, that graph too is I think a helpful visual to see just how far the students have come over the course of this year, okay? This is our special education group. I included the ends for those because I always think that that's helpful. Um, certainly growth across the board, um, but work to do, certainly we're paying close attention, especially to that um, fifth grade group. In general, fifth grade, I believe this is true for math too, we'd, we'd had feedback, not as an excuse, as a point of information though, and confirmed by our rep. Um, those spring scores are, those tests are coming on the heels of three MCAS tests for them. Um, plus, if you're a student in special education, you're also taking your less, let's go learn screeners at the end too. Um, so there was a, you know, they when we met with our rep, they were talking about the feedback of test fatigue in general for grade five. So um, not, you know, obviously don't have definitive data, but it is something that comes up again and again because that it's I think we're like at a two five nine or something in the in the regular population too for three four five. This breaks it down by the domain, how we're doing here. Um, the, in general, it's safe to say that we grew in all, <laughs> grew in green, dropped in red in all domains for, again, all of gen ed and all of special ed. We, we, there is st still some growth to be done for sure. Here's our grade three breakdown. Um, in general, like a really sort of high in the sky view, um, Informational text, nonfiction continues to be our, our Waterloo, um, and we are continuing to try to um, incorporate ways that students have robust practice with that um, in order to clear that hurdle more efficiently. Here's our grade three students with disabilities broken down by the domain levels. And again, we're always growing into green, but there are places that we would like to see more growth for sure. In, Steeper drops in red would be ideal across the board. Grade four for the domains. Grade four students with disabilities. Again, significant growth and significant dropping, but um, you know the, the percentages give us some pointed information about where we need to focus. Okay, and grade five for all students see our same informational text and grade five students with disabilities break down there and then that's our our 35 percent which again of that I think the n is 55 but it, it's still you know something we certainly are aware of and trying to figure out how to address most appropriately not only through the tier one um, benefits that we'll have of a um, new reading program that makes a robust incorporation of informational text, but also through the specific um, interventions that those students who are largely, you know, tier um, three and, and the special education students obviously um, will benefit from on a regular uh, frequency and duration of, inter of intervention. Um, I just put this in as, you know, we were still sort of just dipping our toe in the iReady waters at the middle school. Um, and so we only, 
as I mentioned at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, we just are looking at the reading labs, the tier two classes at the middle school. Um, and so we're already starting with a, a super selected and small population. If we look at grade eight, you know, they're down to 10 by the end of the year out of the whole class, whole grade. Um, and so those, you know, all of a sudden one student equals 10% of the data. So uh, that, that becomes different. Um, you'll also notice that N changes uh, proportionally, it's more drastic, right, when you lose five from 33 as opposed to 300. Um, but that is because as they start to consistently meet uh, grade level standards and do well in their classes, they can drop reading lab over the course of the year in, in middle school. So that also impacts the data that it, it doesn't go along the same trajectory um, because we, we, we don't drop second graders <laughs> along the way, but um, you know, so sixth, seventh, and eighth might move into a, a study or an elective if it's, if it's an option with their schedules at the end of a quarter. Okay, so that, that's why that is going to look wildly different from um, what we're doing when we're doing whole grade level assessments in elementary. Oh, math time. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for reading? Sure. Sure. Uh, data is awesome. And uh, I mean, we all love data because we love the data in and, and, and of itself. But for the schools, the reason the data is important is because you give interventions based on the data. And that's why the number of people in the green are still going up, even with the moving benchmarks you talked about. I was just wondering how responsive is the giving the intervention from the to like is there what's the process of getting red or yellow on the test and getting the intervention is that so does that make sense yes sorry, it's okay. immediate as far okay. as you mean we sort right away at the okay. beginning of the school year as soon as that first um screener is done um and then they're sifted right. We like to start our intervention groups right away, first week of October, and then we start those six to eight weeks progress monitoring cycles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the schools are now finally sort of all on the same schedule for that. That was um, a little bit hurting cats for a little while, but um, so that that's allowing us sort of a cleaner understanding of where people land even at the mid-year and, and people have had the same amount and frequency of dura and duration of um, intervention by the time we have the next progress monitoring check-in. So those happen before the middle of the year do too. Yeah. Does that's that help? Phenomenal. Yeah, like, no, that's, that's been... I mean, we talk about the MTSS data as being so helpful. Getting immediate interventions with kids who need them is like you're not losing a day. Like. Right. That's incredible. Just they, like, and now with these robust teams that we have, the screening can happen that much more quickly mm -hmm. too. It's not like you're still screening into the second week of October because you can just get in and out and get it done. Uh -huh. So that, that's been really, really, really helpful. I'm just so continually impressed with all the MTSS data. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I, I, I it's, it's been nice to, it's sort of also validating, like you sort of, it's your, been your best guess is what's happening, you mm -hmm. know, and then, um, seeing it play out. If you plug in all the numbers and you're like, please go up, please go up. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully it, it usually does. So, um. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten a few questions from parents around um, data is good, but how much time in delivering these tests is uh, potentially taking away from instruction? So I guess I have two questions. One is just like in general, how much time is this and how different, and, and iReady in particular seems to be, a, I don't think most parents have really understand it. Yeah. Um, is it very different than it was five years ago? I and mean, I can see some of the benefits of it, but can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I, I, I won't be able to speak too much to iReady and the amount of time it took five years ago, because I'm not sure, but I know that um, we're looking at approximately two 40 minute sessions and and that's different because it's adaptive for different sure. for kids but um your concern or the concerns people are bringing to you it's a real one that we're all grappling with not just in hingham but all over the place because collection of data is great but you do have to walk that fine line that you're not collecting so much that you're interrupting um time for direct instruction mm -hmm. and and um on sporting gray hair, direct instruction by a professional. I, you know, think too. There, it's it's good to have practice on the um, the the computer programs that we have. But um, I think nothing really beats the direct instruction of a of a specialist, of a trained professional who can really make those decisions in the moment for what a kid most needs. So, um, 
I, I will say we're aware, we're paying close attention to, uh, and that's sort of what I was hinting at with that fifth grade um, conundrum, yeah. um, because then when is the juice no longer worth the squeeze? Because right. you know you're not that it's you know, that we'll cancel data or assess, <laughs> but um, but you do have to be really um, aware of that balance because as soon as you're taking up so much time that interrupts instructional, especially you know when you start cutting down, if and we're not, but if we had to. You know, consider cutting down the the cycles. It, it, it's it's tricky because the, there's you can collect all this data and have no way to move it along if you start encroaching right. on the instructional time. So, I think it's uh, important too for parents to understand. Unlike SCAS, this is given, and then the information is immediately used by the teachers to form groups. For into if your student is struggling, yeah. there are interventions that are put into place, and that information is being used to design instruction to really pinpoint specifically what their needs are. So if you're struggling in something really specific, the intervention is geared towards that. And so that's different than some other types of assessment. It's really a personalized way. And the information is being used. The educators are sitting around looking at the information, having discussions and making plans um, to support the students, including those who are struggling, but also there's conversations about those who are to, that are excelling, how do we continue to push those students forward? So I think that it does take time, but the impact, the impact that it can have on the instruction is really very powerful because it really can personalize the instruction your child is receiving. Yep. And I think the unsatisfying answer is that we, you know, test fatigue is real. We need a legislative solution that gives us this data, which is incredibly useful, infinitely more useful than MCAS data. That we don't children. know how things went until six months later. Right. <laughs> like, like the solution to test fatigue isn't getting rid of this. Right. right. No, but but it, yeah. test fatigue is an it, issue it, that real. needs to be addressed yeah, it's legislatively. Real. And, and, yeah. and as Dr. Adams mentioned, too, that, that institution that we finally have a regular um, data meetings rather than just sort of catching each other on the fly and saying, oh, this looked like this. Um, that's been really helpful too, to be able to be more immediately responsive. Sure. Thank you. And I just have a specific related to that and Tim's question. So you get the, uh, the um, information immediately. Would kids then be put on IEPs? Would you then be able to see whether in kindergarten or first grade, there's a child who is dyslexic? Would so that be identified? The, so th this wouldn't put us, this isn't the testing for IEPs. This is, um, this would, could give us a red flag, right, but more testing would flag, be, okay, right, I just want right. to make sure we were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we do have for, for the dyslexia, dyslexia guidelines, a new sort of, um, it, we've been doing it for ever in Hingham anyway, but sort of beefing up the practices to make sure all the subtests are addressed in the way um, that meet the dyslexia guidelines that just came out in 2020 for Massachusetts. And so, um, there, even this July, there's a new, um, uh, n not new, but a firm sort of now we definitely have to notify parents that if there's been sort of any red flags that could indicate um, that there may be dyslexia, you know, there may be some sort of language learning disability. So we do get that that is what it's that those Dibbles tests are looking for right away at the beginning as of the fall. As young as kindergarten? Mm, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. To add on to that, one of the powers of using the data this way is that if a student is struggling, you provide an intervention, they're not making progress, we change the intervention, try something different, still not making progress, that data can then move to the IST, which is the student support team at the school where educators look at the information, along with the administration and say, yeah, we think the student um, should move forward to have testing to be considered to see if there is a, a disability. And so this gives real-time data because we can intervene, provide an intervention, student doesn't make progress or does make progress and say, oh, let's continue that plan or doesn't make progress and say, should we be considering um, further testing to understand more about what we might be, need to do to meet that student's needs. So. It allows for um, more information for us to make better decisions um, about how are we meeting students' needs and if um, further testing in special education is, is needed. Mm -hmm. And those be decisions for parents as well as teachers. Parents could look at these results and, yeah. and, want more and information. put in for a core evaluation themselves. Yep. And I, I think, uh, th I guess the, the biggest difference for us will be 
we always sent letters to parents to say your child has been picked up for tier three services and explained what that's about and the progress monitoring and that we'll um, keep an eye on that and let them know if this child continues to stay in a tier three group or if they um, move into a tier two group. So now that language is to be a little bit more formalized around the dyslexia screeners, but it's, 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 not, the, it's not a new idea. It's just the way the language will be framed because of the dyslexia guidelines. Thank you. So congratulations. Um, this is really great to see. I mean, I already, it's a tool, it's great, but I think this really speaks to the, um, how effective the system, it wouldn't be It wouldn't be worth anything without the people and the system in place. So oh, yeah. for anyone who doubted when we, we added all those positions, like this, I, I, I hope that they see this. Oh my goodness, <laughs> me too. That reading team, they are awesome. As it, the writing specialist, elementary writing specialist, it's just a dream come true, really. It's, yeah, it's, it's really lucky and it's great for students it, and all the work they put in too. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, so for grades four and five, especially with kids with disabilities, they we, we didn't have so many in the green. Um, and especially with the fifth graders, they're going to the middle school where there isn't such a robust um, tiered system of supports there. What, is there a plan to work with those kids? So it's a little bit, yes, is mm -hmm. the short answer, but it's a, it, it's a little bit, um, that switch in the middle school is a little bit different, at least as far as ELA is concerned, because we have, it depends on where they're teasing out their um, disabilities. So some of the students, when we pick up and show you, here's our N for students with disabilities, I'm not showing you, and I don't know, just looking at the number, how many have reading goals, how many have math goals, how many have executive functioning goals, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the the movement to the middle school next year, similar to what they've done at the high school, is to make the um, special education services uh, discipline specific. Um, and then in the elementary schools, when you are uh, you put on an IEP for a reading goal, almost all the time you would move out of the reading specialist zone into getting your interventions from your special educator. Um, at the middle school, it's prioritized if a student is, so we move into specialized reading versus reading lab, which is more a comp sort of um, focus, comp and vocab. And so if you're, if you're a student who's targeted for specialized reading, you wouldn't be in reading lab. So that, that's interesting about that data too, is that the, you know there are some, those are just the students who are in that tier two bracket and who, if you qualify for both reading lab based on the you know, um, what we have is a, a, um, a full survey of data collection that um, Melissa Goldman, MTSS coordinator runs, collects from all the fifth grade teachers, all their data, all their teacher observations, it collects all of it and does sort of a um, rank order for lack of a better word about where, what services they need in terms of term tier two or term tier three. And you're prioritized for that specialized reading if, if decoding is still um, something that you're bumping up against is problematic and that will happen either with a reading specialist um, or, uh, and that'll be daily, um, or a special educator. If it's just comp issues, um, then and it, it, two things can happen. You can be served service for your comp goal in your strategies class with your special educator and be in reading lab. We have about a 50-50 split in, in those, um, which is different from our tier at the elementary school. It's, it's really more um, special ed for students who are, aside from tier two and, and obviously tier one, but um, if so that becomes more distinct, but there are a few different places that they would fall at the middle school for intervention and the, the highest, um, you know, aside from special education or within their special education class would be specialized reading, which is that daily 47 minute, um, one, two or three student group working on the same, you know, set of decoding skills. And then, um, or the reading lab is, we start with four sections in grade six, which just hold um, about 40 to, to 50 spots for those students because again, even though it's not elementary school anymore, it's still the feeling that if you can get that heaviest dose at the lowest grade of sixth grade, and you'll notice even that the numbers decrease um, as far as need goes. I just wonder, how in fourth and fifth grade, was that comprehension? Did there, that was more of an issue? Right. For kids, so, it, but it doesn't sound like it's, addressed in the small groups, it's kind of the lab. 
So no, right. Yeah. So um, the special education teachers will address comprehension goals, um, but there are also students who um, can end up in reading lab to, it hasn't been sussed out totally. They're, they're starting to kind of, um, even specialized reading has been pulled back into special education a little bit when it had long been sort of the reading specialist realm. So there's still a little bit of overlap there. So you will have students, um, comp goals who are still being addressed in reading lab. But uh, for the most part, and sometimes the truth of this at the middle school is it's schedule dependent to, um, that if it's something that um, can't be addressed in either reading lab or um, daily strategies, it would be, it would, it would flip flop one to the other so that you could catch them either way. So much of it still gets tied up in the schedule. One of the things I add is that um, there are cases you can hear Mary talk about them. What's missing is some of the systems around it. Um, and so Mr. Smith, I know he's on the call too, um, but we started some of that work, this, we kind of dabbled in it, but that's one of the pieces that um, um, Mr. Smith and I have spoken a lot about is sort of instituting data meetings. How can we get folks looking at the data and making some of those decisions about who needs what intervention and what that looks like? So I think the same kind of strengthening you saw at the elementary, we need to carry forth into the middle school. I'll also say the comprehension piece, I think is gonna be really addressed by the new reading program. Um, it's going to include an enormous more amount of informational text mm -hmm. than students have ever seen in the last couple of years. So I, I'm pretty confident we're, hopeful for we're that, going to yeah. see an increase very soon um, into the year as kids are reading just more informational text than they were in the previous reading program. And that's being bolstered too by the interdisciplinary work with Monica in the science in writing, and social yeah. studies and meeting mm -hmm. to vet the new um, reads even this summer with Mr. Hoy. So. Um, trying to make sure that we're embedding that wherever we can. Yeah, it's great. I, I really encourage you to keep doing that because it's clearly working really well at the, the data meetings and, and using that at the elementary level. So yeah. it, to bring it to, through, to pull it through to the middle school would be great. Right. Um, I guess it's all right, and I agree with you on the, the reading program. It sounds like it's going to be great. I just worry about the kids who didn't have that program and are now in middle school and going to high school and how their needs are going to be met going forward. Um, yeah. 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 Right. The journeys. Right. Right. Um, it, it, I think to offset that sort of valid fear too, because you know, as soon as a program gets old, it's like, oh man, well, you know what you didn't know, right? Um, but uh, the the way that we're uh, making sure that the regular ed, uh, the ELA classes in general, are having a more balanced exploration of nonfiction versus fiction too, has been a focus of the department in general. So that tier one piece is being boosted as well. Um, but I, I, to echo Margaret's point too about uh, we did have our first round of data meetings at the middle school and they were really impactful. It was really helpful. We, we've never all sat in a room with all the teachers, special educators of a certain grade level and administrators and Mr. Smith and I, it was, it was really, um, so carving the time to make that a regular practice, I agree, will be really, really helpful. Okay, all right. try not to break it, okay. Guys, one more question. I'm sorry. Nope. I could talk about this stuff all night. We'll have a lot of mutiny on the chip. Uh, look at thinking about that. So sort of going off of Carrie's question, as things go to the middle school, is a lot of the reading interventions for non-special ed students happen in the in the ELA classrooms? Uh, yes, and 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 so now that we have. Um, one of the things that we have, and one thing that we don't talk about too much here because it doesn't assess it, but what I certainly have my eye on all the time, especially in our late great MGAS data three years later um, after the test is taken, um, is writing uh, too, right? Because this doesn't assess any of that. We need to preserve a lot of instructional time for that. So um, we have one of the reasons that, uh, so short answer is yes, but uh, we now have, um, trying to build in more time. We have three blocks at the writing specialist. She can use her five, she teaches two, but five of the blocks um, to push in. So she has a sign up 
genius form of people just sign up for her to come in, but she's also a um, certified reading specialist, uh, ELA teacher. She was at the high school for a while um, and SEL. Yeah. So they sign up for her to push in, not just for writing services, okay. which has been awesome. And, and truth be told, we've long um, tried to make it so that Melissa, who does the eighth grade reading labs and Jenna, who does the seventh, also have some blocks free to free to push in to um, to support literacy in the classroom. Uh, tricky part about that is we always have the best laid plans and then there are more specialized reading needs mm -hmm. so they, they have to pick up those sections. But um, for Holly's schedule, we've been able to preserve that. And she's made some fabulous um, inroads and not just in ELA classes, the history teachers and the science teachers have been inviting her in too. And she's been, it's been really pivotal. And if we could open up- That, that was gonna be my suggestion yeah. that uh, that's, history teacher I right look at a lot of you said I mean the fantastic sentences nonfiction reading and writing has sort of been our water totally. loo, which yes is, yeah <laughs> uh, write a thesis you know hold master's thesis on that <laughs> sentence but uh, I think a lot of the really robust nonfiction reading and writing doesn't happen in the ELA classroom right. happens in the history classroom so really encouraging to like loop Definitely, definitely. Anytime we History, can spare literacy specialists into, into that work, mm -hmm. right? And and like I said, Holly's been spending quality time in, in those classes. And if we could get uh, Melissa and Jenna mm -hmm. read up a little specialized reading, you always think, oh, we have your two blogs, and then boom, um, they get filled up at the 11th hour. But that's that's how we're addressing it uh, around the No more questions schedule. for you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and just a quick comment and kind of feedback. Um, I think that there was some concern that I also heard from mostly elementary parents mm. about the amount of screen time. But what um, in our school council meeting, what I was hearing from the teachers and the principal was that actually when parents were coming in for conferences and being able to see the individualized data yeah. and really understanding that, it was so helpful for parents to see what was going on. But also the students' feedback was really great because they don't mind the screen time necessarily, <laughs> but, um, but they felt it was a more fun type of test for them. But because it was adaptive, it was almost it was like different every time. Yeah, yeah different it's not, every time. Right, so right. it wasn't boring, like you know, some other assessments they may say. But also because it had that immediate impact, it was really great for the kids because they felt like if in certain areas they really were seeing success, that they might be switched in the direction of what they were working on or being given more challenge reading. Yeah. And so the kids were really and they could see the direct correlation. Yeah. You remind me too in observing a few reading labs. Um, this year at the middle school, uh, some of the time was spent in, uh, I saw an eighth and a seventh one, um, individually quickly, but mm -hmm. individually conferencing, going over the latest progress monitoring on um, my path or on um, the iReady screener itself and, and seeing, well, this is, you know, going well here, 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 what do you think here? And, um, you know, even conversations with the students where you might reset what they're practicing because neither the teacher nor the student thinks that it's an, ac an accurate match of where they are, that it was a tired day or something. And you don't want a student to be brought backwards on that trajectory just because of a weird day. Right, and I do think it had, for you know the younger students, especially that engagement with them, because it was kind of that excitement and um, constant movement. Right, it also becomes a bit of a game to them to, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we like our games. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you uh, to the whole uh, reading team for everything they did uh, to launch that. And um, in our uh, ER, uh, ELA world, we did have um, some robust data practices, the Acadian Civil Test again, had been administered from a, for a number of years. Um, so I do think the implementation of I ready and mathematics has really um, helped us to bolster in math. We did not have that same uh, level of data practices, and so it's really been. Um, incredibly helpful um, for the math domain as well. Um, so sure, you can progress to the next slide. Um, and so um, just to give um, a high-level overview of where we are at in end of year for math, um, so we are seeing um, for K-6 to six, that we are exceeding expectations uh, for typical annual growth, so the range is from 119 to 157%. Uh, when we take a look at, at our subgroup of special education students, they too are exceeding expectations for the typical annual growth of the range 100 to 131. Um, and we're seeing, again, significant growth into the that on or above uh, grade level category and um, significant decrease in that two or more um, below grade level category. 
Um, and we also, one of the really uh, terrific features of iReady is to allow us to dive deep into the domain. And we are seeing um, at the end of the year a fairly uh, even balance and achievement across the four domains of mathematics. Um, we do emphasize earlier in the year numbers and operations and algebraic thinking where they are so uh, essential uh, to all domains of math, but we are um, seeing a uh, nice um, balance um, as we approach the end of the year. And just to echo um, uh, what Mary had mentioned around the test fatigue, we are very much paying attention to it, particularly um, our fifth graders um, have not only ELA and math MCAT, also have um, fifth grade science MCAT, and this iReady math assessment was the very last test they took of the battery of tests um, at the end of the year. So again, something that we are mindful of, um, both as we um, analyze the data and also um, just are, are aware of our students' um, social emotional um, uh, piece at the end of the year. Sorry, right, can we move to the next slide, great. Um, so similar to Mary, this is uh, for math showing uh, the progress towards annual, annual growth, um, seeing um, scores ranging from 119% uh, progress um, all the way up to 146%. Next slide. Um, and taking a look at our K2, just a reminder that um, for kindergarten, uh, we do not show uh, two grade levels below, um, given um, uh, that we are uh, testing uh, kindergartners. Uh, but we are seeing uh, really uh, great growth um, in mathematics from beginning of year to the end of the year. So at the beginning of the year, the students were um, in the 20 to 28th percentile uh, for K2. And by the end of the year, um, the students in K2 were in the mid-80s for honor above grade level. Next slide. Um, similarly, uh, for grades uh, three to five, um, we saw some really um, very nice growth. Um, earlier uh, in the year, um, our third graders uh, were at 25% on or above grade level and hit the 88% at the end of the year. Grade four, beginning of the year at uh, 49 and hitting 90% um, at the end of the year. And fifth graders, 64% uh, to begin the year and 87% on or above grade level at the end of the year. Um, I mentioned that comparison earlier on in the year. Um, if you will recall from our beginning of year and middle of year um, data that we shared, uh, there was um, some kind of unevenness uh, with greater strength in numbers and operations and algebraic thinking which is very much by design in the everyday math program, um, really making sure that those skills are, are solid um, before moving into measurement data, measurement and data and geometry. And you'll you now see at the end of the year a much even uh, spread across uh, the four domains of math. Um, going through uh, first grade, again, uh, we do see um, some uh, fair, fairly even um, progress um, between uh, the four domains. Uh, similarly, uh, for grade two, uh, same uh, even distribution um, in the 80s um, for all four domains. Uh, for grade three, we do see uh, but still a bit of unevenness in geometry. Um, and really seeing uh, some areas of strength in algebra and algebraic thinking, um, but still um, very much uncomfortable in Zoom. Um, grade four, again, a bit of unevenness in the geometry, um, which is anticipated, and some real strength in algebraic thinking and numbers and operations. And at uh, grade five, um, we're seeing a fairly even uh, distribution between the four domains. Um, so unlike ELA um, for math, um, all sixth graders do um, uh, use the iReady diagnostic. And so for our sixth grade uh, cohort, uh, we were seeing students um, at 63% um, on or above grade level at the beginning of the year and ending the year at 88%. Um, their progress towards annual growth um, was actually um, exceeding that 100% mark um, at 157% and um, seeing a range um, from geometry at 75% to 
um, to 88% for algebra and algebraic thinking and measurements and data when looking at the domain. And taking a look at our special education um, subgroups, um, again, seeing some very nice growth. Um, our special ed students were either um, on or above um, that annual uh, growth. Can I ask a question, Katie, about that? Sure, sir. When you're talking about special ed students, are you talking about all special ed groups? Are you talking about students with a specific math disability? Excellent question, Tim. Uh, when, it, when the data is pulled, it is all special education students, so that's an important point to note. That might, that might explain why the second grade special ed students are doing better than the general <laughs> students. <laughs> well, they're doing better in, in terms, yeah, in terms of their, their progress uh, yeah. towards the okay. Yes. I yes. Like, I yes. Um, and so we're taking a look at um, our K-2 um, special education students. Um, I just wanted to note that um, if you looked at uh, the presentation um, earlier this weekend when I put in the folder for the school committee, um, they did make a few adjustments. And so the, um, the more accurate version of the presentation um, was uh, put into your folder this afternoon. Um, so some of you might have seen uh, an earlier version of it. He did. Uh, make a few adjustments um, to the special education data just in case you're um, looking at an older version of the document. The current version um, is in your folder. Um, and so I'm taking a look at um, our K2 students uh, for special education. Again, seeing um, some nice growth um, for the beginning of year to the end of year, but still, of course, seeing some disproportionality when we are looking at our special education group as compared um, to our uh, general education, um, uh, all student uh, population. And our grade three, five uh, special education data, again, similarly uh, seeing some nice growth. Um, did want to make note again, uh, there was um, some anecdotal reports in particular of our fifth grade students experiencing um, tough fatigue. Um, in, in particular for math, where it was um, their very last test of a pretty robust uh, battery of tests um, at the end of the year. So um, we do um, keep that in mind as we are uh, looking at the end of year um, data. And for our uh, sixth grade uh, special education students, as Tim did mention, um, it does represent all, all special education students, not um, students specifically. Uh, with math goals, um, we did see um, some nice growth beginning of the year at 30%, uh, 31% um, on or above grade level, ending the year at 66%, uh, percent. so still some work to do, um, but some nice growth made. And that is our final slide of the evening. Um, happy to take any questions on the math, um, and also happy to text Dave if, if there are questions um, that I cannot answer. Hi, Kate. Yeah. Um, I said, I did. I, you had mentioned that um, on a few of the younger grades that the geometry with the scores that is anticipated, I didn't know if you could expand upon that a little bit. Is that just? Yeah, so, um, so the, Emphasis in um, math instruction, really, number and operations and algebraic thinking. And unless those two domains are mastered, um, measurements and data, for example, um, you really do need to um, master that number and operations and so on before um, uh, addressing measurement. And so, in terms of um, both our, our, our curriculum, it, it's very much front loads. The number of operations and uh, the, G, uh, the um, algebraic thinking at the beginning of the year, and working on some of those um, kind of uh, we we sometimes call them power standards and secondary standards. The power standards being the algebraic thinking and the number of operations, and those um, kind of other domains um, are kind of secondary standards, if you will. Um, and so, um, both in terms of how the curriculum. Um, spirals and progresses. Um, we are seeing um, that um, again, we are front loading those uh, skills. Also, in terms of the IRD MyPAP, which is that personalized learning tool, that uh, program prioritizes 
the number and operations and the algebraic thinking because they are um, so as such a critical foundation for all future math knowledge that when the students are on my path, um, the iReady um, personalized learning tool is really making sure that the number and operations and algebraic thinking are solidified before even bothering with the uh, geometric thinking and um, the measurement and data component. Thank you. Did that answer your question? It did. It did. I, just, I was remembering um, back to, I think it was the presentation. Maybe, gosh, it was the spring. Maybe it was the winter. <coughs> Um, my, I believe they went over the MCAS um, data and then also there was geometry kind of stood out there too. So I was just kind of making a yeah, correlation there. Yeah, I think there. you just mentioned at, at that um, point in the, uh, the MCAS presentation that as we were approaching kind of, you know, that, that pandemic yep. um, recovery, we similarly prioritized the algebraic thinking yep. when we were making curriculum choices in um, those years coming off of the pandemic to make sure that students were really solidifying those skills because so much um, is dependent on those as you progress throughout now. Yes, I, re I remember that um, with Dave explained that, but I just wanted to just um, get a little bit more information. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Can I, can I go back to the beginning of the <laughs> when you were talking about the next steps for MTSS. Uh, Absolutely. I was, I was wondering if it would make sense, uh, given our equity audit of last week, to have an explicit step to look at some of the high risk uh, groups in Hingham and just make sure that this progress is being made across the board. I know I know we're doing that, but I'm just wondering if that's a, sort of explicit in the process. Absolutely. Uh, one thing we are working on with our data specialists your data is only as good as the accuracy of the data that you have. And so we are working with our data specialists just to make sure that in Aspen, we are coding um, the high needs populations in a way that it will um, uh, talk to the iReady platform. Um, and so our, our special ed data is, is, is clean. And so um, the Aspen and the iReady um, work together seamlessly um, our high needs, we need to um, figure out um, uh, how to make the two programs um, talk better. And so that is um, something that we do hope for future years that we could also um, I pull up some of those additional subgroups um, for the purposes of analyzing um, the IREADY data. Cool. And to, until the data is ready, is there any reason to believe that progress isn't being made across the board? Um, we don't have any when indications looking, of that. Yeah. Okay. When, and so again, we do uh, when we do our data meetings, we're looking at averages, but we are also looking at individuals. Mm -hmm. And so when um, you know our, our first grade, I see Katie Osterman on the call. Uh, when Katie Osterman uh, works with the first grade team at Plymouth River, they're not just looking at the average scores; they are actually looking at individual student scores and trying to develop interventions in a personalized way. Uh, for those students. Um, so um, th th with this system, individuals are not falling through the cracks because um, the teachers and the specialists and the school administrators um, through their data meetings are not only looking at averages, but also looking at individuals. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very right, informative. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you the, to the team of educators and to our students for persisting um, despite the uh, end of year testing. Um, all right, so next on the agenda is to discuss community service requirements for graduation and act as appropriate. Um, Dr. Adams, I don't know if you want to take us through this. Yes, we have um, the high school team here. I'll invite them up. Um, to talk a little bit about um, the proposal to begin to think about um, supporting a community service requirement at the high school. I, I know there's been rich discussions at the school site council um, about um, the community service and sort of how to get this started um, into next year as a pilot. Come on up. And I know you have a team here with you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Adams, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I am joined tonight by my school council co-chair, Jasper Lee, 
who is a recent graduate of Hingham High School. Uh, Jasper, as you may know, was the first ever student co-chair of school council. Uh, and he was elected to that position back in the fall. He's particularly invested in the topic that's on the agenda tonight too. And it's a response to one of our school improvement goals for this year and a goal that will continue into next year, which is to enhance community service opportunities for Hingham High School students. And in the course of that discussion, this year we spent a lot of time uh, exploring whether our school ought to implement a community service requirement uh, for graduation, which is something that, that is very common. Um, you know, we, we learned in the course of researching um, community service requirements at benchmark districts that literally 50%, exactly 50% of benchmark districts have a similar type of requirement. And so we're proposing that Hingham High School uh, follow uh, that path and implement a community service requirement beginning with students who are in the class of 2028. Those are students who will be entering eighth grade this year and won't be coming to Hingham High School for a little over a year. Um, as you know, I think from what's uh, the document that's in your packet, uh, which is just a very brief bullet point summary of our discussion at the school council level this year, that uh, really was a major focus for us from February through the end of the year. So it appeared on our agenda uh, for five consecutive monthly meetings. And uh, it began with a discussion uh, led by members of our student advisory committee. Actually, the four students, uh, including Nathan, Nathan Tesler and Alex Doggett, who are very familiar to, to all of you at the table, uh, they did a lot of work in terms of researching and helping us to develop the proposal. And then we spent a lot of time discussing the proposal, refining it, uh, and, and reaching a consensus before the end of the year that we ought to propose to the school committee uh, a 40 hour graduation requirement with a 10 year uh, or 10 hour uh, monthly requirement so that students could chip away at it essentially over the course of the four years. Um, we would prorate it uh, for students who transfer into Hingham High School late uh, and that we would maintain a website. Um, we actually have the website well underway with the help of another school council member who's in the room tonight, Katie Sutton. Uh, who, who also is uh, very passionate about this issue. So um, I, would, I would welcome uh, Jasper and then potentially Katie to comment on this as well. And we, we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, again, there are a few additional details in the memo, but I think that, that summarizes the, some of the key points. Jasper, would you like to comment uh, a little bit uh, on this as well? Jasper always looks more like the principal than I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a good reason. If you haven't met Jasper yet, you'll see as soon as he's completed his first uh, couple of sentences, it, it was an excellent choice for us for school council co-chair this year. Uh, well, I'm not after your job quite yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I am uh, able to talk about this. And uh, you know, we were able to get a wide range of views among students, staff. This is really something. Uh, that people are interested in. I remember, uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, but back when we were looking at getting a new superintendent, back when we were in the process of interviewing Dr. Adams and the three other candidates, uh, we held student interviews. I was at all four of those student interviews. And the one thing that all four candidates were very surprised to learn was that Hingham High School didn't have a community service graduation requirement. They all expressed their surprise at that. Um, and when you look at the other districts uh, that we like to compare ourselves to, a lot of them have uh, graduation requirements. Uh, they range from anywhere between 25 and 80. So we're 40, we're, which is the mean, I believe, is 45, and the median, I believe, is 40. Um, and it's something that brings a lot of additional value to a Hingham High School diploma and a Hingham High School experience. I'm sure that the people here who have uh, experience helping their child through the college admissions process know that when you're filling out the Common App, this is something that they look for in the Common App. It's definitely very useful for college application, for scholarship opportunities, and it provides a lot of value to Hingham High School students uh, for in the future. Um, and I think that this is something that would be very beneficial uh, going forward. And you know, certainly, I'm ready to answer any questions you have, too. Thanks, Jasper. Um, and Katie, would you yeah, yeah. Well, if it's okay with the committee, since Katie's here too, and she spent a lot of time on this. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm coming off a trip, some of you know, uh, to Appalachia last night. We got back at 10 o'clock. I slept till one today. Um, it's a trip where we build home or we repair homes for some of the poorest people in this country. Um, and I've gone for six years. And every Saturday night, we sit around and we have a sharing circle. Um, and it's a trip with teenagers. And um, I've watched the hang on participation fall off and I've watched the Cohasset participation grow. We also have kids from Situate and Hull and other random places because um, we welcome everyone. Everyone. And um, I'm going to tell the share story that we hear a lot from the kids, and I'm going to tell it a little backwards. And it is this week has changed my life. You know, these kids com come from like a really privileged background. They're popular, beautiful children. Um, and they just like probably, you know, wouldn't have thought to sign up for this trip. Um, and what they start talking about. Uh, before they talk about how it changed their life and how they had no idea that people in this country were this poor and how they're going to go, go back and bring this back and bring it to everything they do going forward. And um, the first thing they say is, I only went on this trip for the service hours. And they're not embarrassed to say that because of what they say after, <laughs> and they mean it. But they only go for the service hours. And so to get these kids to come, to me, like having a requirement for like this, it, it will open up these kids' worlds in a way that not having a requirement might not. So I just want to like support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Katie, and uh, for the work you've done with the, with the council all along, particularly on this issue. And um, Michelle was at the table for a lot of those discussions as well as our school council liaison. And um, you know, we, we feel comfortable with the proposal that, that we've provided to you. Um, our hope is that the school committee will, will agree in principle that this is a good direction for us. And uh, if so, we'd, we'd be very happy to begin drafting the language that will be included in our school's program of studies uh, and the student handbook going forward to, to implement a new graduation requirement uh, of 40 hours for all uh, Hingham High School graduates be, uh, beginning with the class of 2028. Yeah. Um, and I think we, as a committee, we all volunteer our time, so we can appreciate that the volunteerism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are some members who have questions, so I'm going to go to Jen. I just have a question for you. Sure. So, of my own thoughts, if you don't mind. Uh, my first question is, um, can students carry, it was 40 hours, and you had it broken down for 10 hours per, per grade. So my question is, can students carry over their hours if they accumulated in excess of 10 per year? Yes, our, our proposal would would allow for students to to you know, so they could technically do all forty their freshman year. You you could theoretically um, really get uh, get going on this, okay. and you know our, our our belief would be that a student who's probably done forty hours in their ninth grade year is not going to sit out the next three years. Absolutely, <laughs> they'll they'll have the bug in the same way that those students who return this week from from Appalachia with uh, Katie's group. Uh, would probably have had a life-changing experience uh, and be very likely to continue. Uh, so I think that's right at the heart philosophically of our thinking mm -hmm. is that this will be something that changes uh, people's lives in a, in a really positive way. Uh, and somebody who does those 40 hours is, is unlikely to stop at that point. Can I just add something to that? Just based on the memo, it says the, um, it's including a minimum of 10 hours per year. Right. So therefore, a student could go beyond beyond the 10 beyond and, the it, right, the 10. and complete the full 40 hour requirement uh, in, in a shorter amount of time. So and we also so we so that said we, you have to do a minimum of 10 per year. Per year. Yeah, per OK. Year. So, so we could just I, I think the that. intention there we, we could yep. we certainly have not gotten real specific with the drafting of the language yet, but would um, it would the intention was to make sure that people didn't leave leave it for junior or senior yeah. year and start late. So you'd have to do at least 10 in ninth grade and then going for, I guess, a minimum of 10 until you've met the requirement would be a better way to put it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my second question is, so we're calling this a graduation requirement. So if students mm -hmm. didn't complete their 10 hours their freshman year, would they then, are you then saying that they can't <laughs> Graduate? Yeah, also a fair point. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I I think we would you know we would probably figure out some mechanism for staying on those students and but not uh, you know not deny a, a diploma to somebody who had met the overall forty hour requirement. 
but the expectation would be you're not leaving at all until the very end and, and then add that extra layer of stress to to a senior to have to accumulate such a large amount of hours in a short amount of time. But the graduation requirement essentially would be to have met the 40 hours prior to graduation. Okay. So if um, just my one note on that would be that I would think that we would need a policy on that related because it would be a graduation require, requirement. That's just my one comment have, on that. Do and we then, have a policy on graduation requirements? No, but um, many of the other districts that I did look at that do have the actual requirements do have policies. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that we, I think that we, as a committee, could discuss whether we would want a policy yeah. on that requirement. Um, um, I think, sorry, I think you might just because there are the state mandated graduation yes. requirements and where this isn't a requirement of the state. Yeah. And I think also, whereas it's a requirement for something that happens outside of school hours mm -hmm. that we're putting in, I think you would want to have a particular policy for that. We do vote uh, on the handbook every year. So that's another way to set policy through the handbook. So. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. Your program is fully. Oh, yes. Cool. Um, I think she's gonna oh, yeah. All right, so I'm just going to say my, my piece. <laughs> um, I've been a very, I mean, I've been volunteering my entire life. Um, it's been part of my life, I think, since I was in high school. Um, and I definitely feel, I fully recognize the importance of the benefits of giving your time and helping others and how it can provide you in a, it can be a very meaningful way. Um, however, I don't feel that community service should be mandatory. Um, I feel that mandatory service, it, once it's mandatory, it removes the, how genuine it is um, on the intent of volunteering. Um, instead, I feel like you know, schools can continue to encourage the civic engagements within the schools, you know, continue to enforce how important it is to consider our volunteer opportunities. Um, Students have a very tight schedule, some in part due to their studies, and some students already belong to clubs, um, and they do participate in volunteering through those clubs. Um, some of them do it through the sports. Um, the US Census reports, I think it's one in four students above the age of 16 has a part-time job. Um, and some, some of those students have family responsibilities, whether, whether they're taking care of their siblings or driving their siblings around. Um, and, that, and then that on top of their extracurricular activities, their homework, their social time. Um, and I feel that forcing it, it, it kind of fails to, we're not looking at all the outside obligations that these students have outside of school. Um, I, would, I, I personally um, instead would rather see having a community service graduation requirement that it's more of a recognition of community service program where if students have X amount of hours that they perform, they would um, either receive maybe a special recognition at graduation. Um, and I would even suggest that those students complete um, a community service reflection form. Um, that way it's community service is far more likely to be meaningful um, once the students have the ability to reflect on it. So that's just, my two cents. <laughs> fair, fair points, and I, and, and I appreciate. And, I, and, it. Oh, and one last thing, I just want to thank you, Katie. Thank you, Jasper. Um, I, I completely agree with you on how important community service is, how life changing it can be. Um, I guess my my concern is how we're is the mandatory part of it. Right. That's generally my concern. Fair points, and I, and I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate that perspective very, very much, and um, and the spirit in which you share that, P particularly given the, uh, the enormous credibility that everyone at this table has in terms of volunteer service. There are few people in this town or any town who who give community service voluntarily in greater volume than you do. It's uh, it, it is truly remarkable, and, and our community is stronger because of it. Uh, I'll acknowledge my own mixed feelings about this historically. I've worked at Hingham High School for 16 full years now. And at no point during those 16 years has the school had a, a mandatory um, community service requirement. Outside of, we did for a while have an expectation that 
uh, students in grade 12 who were taking a social studies elective had to complete some community service in connection with that course. That requirement of the, of the social studies courses was dropped um, probably five or six years ago. Do you remember, Andy, exactly when that happened? Right. Yeah. Right. So um, at any rate, the topic has come up over the course of those 16 years a number of times, and, and I have felt conflicted about it for some of the same reasons that, that you just expressed. This year, in, in the course of examining it more closely and devoting more time to it, I, I have become convinced that this would be a good move for us. And uh, in, in my own evolution on this question was impacted to, to a very significant degree by the students who, who began the research for this. The four members of our student advisory committee, I thought did a terrific um, job in terms of um, researching programs that were out there and, and reflecting on the value of those programs and then bringing to our school council a very thoughtful proposal about uh, a program that they thought would improve our school. And in the course of the, the conversations as well, our student representatives on the school council, all, all six of them, at the high school level, fully a third of the school council uh, are student, uh, student members. Jasper's one of six. And, uh, and to a person, the, the students were enthusiastic about this. They, they all had had some experience with community service, really valued it, and wanted not just some of their classmates, but all of them to, to have that same sort of experience. And I think there are a lot of students who probably like the uh, students that Katie described were, were led to their community service for some external reason. And at our school, in many cases, it's the desire to become a member of the National Honor Society. And there are a lot of students, there'll be 100 plus students every year whose GPA will make them eligible to apply for NHS. They have that extrinsic motivation and lots of cases, the only thing that drives them to to sign up and, and to do that community service hours. But so often afterwards, I'm really glad they, they had. Uh, it's for me in, in thinking, not only the students on our council who were enthusiastic about this, but as I thought about whether we can broaden the impact, not only broaden the impact on our community and the good that will be done in the community by additional service hours, but for the students who do it, who may lack the extrinsic motivation that some students have, or have somebody pushing them, whether it's a parent uh, or a friend or somebody, but could we ensure that every one of our students would have that kind of experience? That's moved me to the point where I now feel comfortable recommending this as something that would make our school stronger and our, and our community stronger. Uh, but I certainly understand multiple perspectives on this um, and there's a, there are arguments to be made um, you know, on both sides. I think it's important to also to note that the, all of the things that students already do as part of their athletics, their clubs will all count. Potentially some of the things that you were mentioned, Jen, about you know, helping siblings and also could potentially count in some way. You know, there could be, there are lots of ways that students could meet this requirement. Um, and it's meant to be open-ended for students to find their path. And I would just add as the mother, I, I have had my conflicted feelings too as an educator. But now as a mom of two teenagers who don't do anything unless it's required <laughs> or they see that extrinsic motivation, it's gonna help me get into college. But yet the benefits, they once they do it, once they get involved in that club they didn't wanna get involved in, but get involved because they wanna look better on their college application or they, they take that extrinsic motivation that's there and then they finally take the plunge. The benefit in the learning from that first risk, first jumping into it, are, are so impactful. And so I think there is something about requiring teenagers to do something that they may not want to do um, is um, necessary, um, but um, in the end, they benefit so much from it. And it's good to hear that the students involved in community service kind of recognize that a bit themselves, that yeah, sometimes we need folks to tell us we have to do this in order for us to reap the benefits mm -hmm. um, and the positives. I think Jasper wants to yeah. jump in. If, if, I could just, if you um, want to come up to the mic, Jasper. Yes, right. 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 <laughs> Love microphones. Uh, and <laughs> if I could just add to uh, what's just been said, you know, looking at all of the things that we have in Hingham already, we have sky high participation in athletics and a lot of those athletic teams already do uh, different forms of community service. 
uh, these things all count, whether you're doing it as part of your sports team or as part of your uh, chosen place of worship. Uh, you know, Harperman Helping Hingham Day gets you about halfway there for your senior year anyway. Uh, so, so it's not an unreasonable requirement. You know, when we actually looked at the different districts that do this, we looked at not only what the number was that they came up with, but we actually talked to some of the people uh, who were playing a part in that. We talked to the students who attend these districts. We talked to the actual members of staff uh, who implement these policies. Uh, and something that we didn't uh, notice was that, you know, part of the reason why 40 is such a good number is because it's not such a small number as to be tokenistic. It's genuinely meaningful when you see that number, uh, for example, on a college application, it's genuinely meaningful and an opportunity to have that life-changing experience that's been alluded to. But at the same point, it's not doing too much. Um, you know, Harborman Helping Hingham Day uh, gets you about halfway there during your senior year with all of the different sports teams. And, you know, there are so many opportunities to volunteer in Hingham High School. You don't even necessarily have to leave the high school building. So those things that they do with their extracurriculars, you know, I understand how busy high school students are. I might know a thing or two about that myself. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, certainly the ways in which, you know, I would estimate that maybe 80 or 90 percent when I talked to, to different students about this number, 80 or 90 percent felt like, you know what, what? I kind of already do this. So it's really about doing two things. It's about making sure that everybody can be involved. And that's why I think that it's important uh, to have it as a requirement. But also the fact that this adds value to a Hingham High School diploma. Having this as a requirement, that, that tells um, whoever's looking uh, at a student from Hingham High School that this credential not only means that, you know, you got a C in, a, in English or math, but it also means that you have uh, engaged in a genuine and, and a serious community service uh, responsibility. Yeah, and I would just, I, I think that's why I was suggesting an incentive program as opposed to a um, mandatory requirement. Um, so, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I respect your opinion. I, I hear that concern. I do think it's very valid and it should be something considered. Um, it was one of my questions and Jasper answered it was there is a lot already done with Harborman Helping Day and other community service during the school hours and activities and if that would be counted. So I'm glad to hear that it would be. But I do think it's also worth considering. We know we're in a mental health crisis and one of the biggest things that can help people who are suffering is by doing service to others. And so I think that's a great um, kind of spin on it too, is giving the students an opportunity to serve others and to try to help them to engage and to be thinking about other people more than they may naturally. But I do think we really have to think um, about other opportunities during the school day to make sure that everyone has access to be able to do it without additional time. And it sounds like there's a lot of ways to do that already. Okay. And so I just want to say I fully support this. I think it, it's great. Um, we always hear that Hingham runs on volunteers, and this is it's kind of about priorities because there are a lot of different pulls on people's time, sports and academics and extracurricular. And this is kind of us saying that we think this is important too. Um, so I, I think it's good. And just to kind of piggyback on some other points, people go to community service for all sorts of reasons. Um, outside of school committee, I'm on the, the SNAP, the Special Needs Athletic Partnership Board. And the mentors, we have a lot of volunteer mentors for all the programs, they come for all sorts of reasons. It could be like doing a favor for a former coach or their friends are coming and, and then they're a lot of times they're hooked and they, they love it. And But they wouldn't have done it if not for, and some of them do it because of, I think National Honor Society um, volunteer requirements. So they come for all sorts of reasons. So I think giving uh, giving everybody a reason to volunteer and you know prioritizing community service is huge. Um, I thank you for putting a, a reasonable number of hours like 40 is, you know, it's, it's reasonable. It's, as you said, it's not tokenistic, but it's a substantial amount. Um, and I think it's, it should hopefully not overload anyone too, because there are a lot of pulls on people's time. Um, and I guess the thing that does it for me is that it was led by the students for this. Um, it's not us saying, oh, isn't it be, wouldn't it be great if they volunteered? It's, you know, the fact that it comes from the students who, are, who really are in a good position to go, this is what it would be good for our schools is huge. So I'm fully supportive of it. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. So uh, it was just sidebarring with Ali from our experience, just a few years ago, graduating from high school. Did we, uh, I, I actually thought that we did have, um, I remember doing community yeah. service, and I we thought did. it was a requirement. 
Do, does anyone have the backstory of uh, maybe it wasn't graduate, like why it was gotten rid of? I don't remember being like at this just part of social studies. I thought it was all of us needed to do it. Do we? Do you have any? That's, a, from, that's a great question. I wish Doc Gallo was in the room. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, historian of being public schools. You all were here when we graduated. Yeah. At some point. Um, did you Did you come across? Michelle, this? Michelle, Michelle Ashley knows. Oh, I think oh, you're okay. probably from the community now. I'm coming from now. He's too young. I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, but I do. I do actually remember because often I used to help with kids cab and the kids used to ask me can you sign my thing to say that I've completed my hours I was like am, do I have the authority to do that <laughs> yes, I do. Um, but my understanding was that and it, this was actually one of my questions that the reason that we stopped doing it as part of the history requirement was because it was there was a lot of staff involvement and the staff the teachers were having to track the hours and maybe the kids had a right of reflection and then it became a well, who's tracking the hours and how do we know and who's are we grading these we're, you know are we grading these reflections is it just talking to the kids you know and i think that's what sort of that's where it sort of fell out because it became a lot for each individual staff member in the history department to do and then the idea came to be like why don't we just do one big community service day that all the kids could participate in and then ben yeah, mockheim took that not necessarily every kid took social studies senior right year, yes going back to what Jasper was saying, all students should have this experience, right? So, but as far as the historical, you know, institutional knowledge, was it ever something not related to just social studies? I don't know that. It was. Yeah. I know that other kids that have graduated from you guys said the same thing. Wait, they already have that. They have that. And I'm like, not anymore, though. But all the, all the senior. No, I'm in that group too, right? I'm a kid. Uh, and, and Matt, did you have something else? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. Did you? Have oh, no, I was just saying all the seniors do do have to participate in it, correct? At the end of the year. It's optional. It, it is optional. I mean, you have to go to class, it's, but it's a choice between going to class and going to do community <laughs> last, service. So like pretty much school. everyone chooses, mm, I don't really want to go to class. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's the honest truth. Um, uh, you know, uh, that's a pretty good incentive to do community service. But I like uh, the opportunity that it gives for some kids who may be uncomfortable yeah. with it, that they do have that other outlet to go to class instead. Yep, and I'm and, uh, not sure I... I'm sure someone ended up doing that, but I can't think of anybody from the top of my head. Uh, but in addition to that, I do know from talking to some of the history teachers, I tried to talk with as many people about that. That was one of the benefits I had of being in a building every day. Uh, some of the history teachers, uh, you know, a lot of them told me that just the amount of time that they were spending on it, especially because, you know, they have their own curriculum, uh, right? This doesn't cut into any uh, time that needs to be spent planning or grading or doing any of those things. So that's a major difference. And you know that was a definitely a big problem that existed last time around um, from what I've gathered from teachers who would have been teaching at the time. So that's a, maybe a two part follow up. One is just the tracking of this. Like who is that on, is that at the administrative? Like how, how have we, and like, uh, let me ask the second question too, because I think there's been a lot of good things that have come up. I don't, I, I uh, I would say um, fully support the idea of people and children, people and children doing, uh, maybe not children, high school kids doing community service um, and children, younger children. Um, I guess I haven't. I this feels like a big decision in some ways that I, uh, you know, to add a graduation requirement associated with this, and maybe I missed sort of a previous discussion on this. Like I feel like Nathan talked about. Um, some of the study that was going on. Um, but as I, you know, we talked through some of the specifics of it, you know, 10 hours, you know, what happens to the freshman that doesn't do the 10 hours, what's included in, in community service. You know, I didn't see in the memo, you gave some good examples. I guess I'm a little worried that we haven't fully, we collectively, not school committee, kind of thought through um, all of the logistics associated with this. And I think what we're potentially approving today is yes, it's a pilot, but like this is, it's not really a pilot, it's going live the following year, right? Like that's what's on the table is an approval of. So the 20 to 
of, of a graduation requirement for 2028. Yeah. 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 Well, it depends on the motion that's made. But, okay. Yeah. But I agree. That's okay. Sorry. So that, yeah. I guess, so maybe this one. Well, so second was a comment. The first was the question of who's going to track it. So let's not remember, like, it's a soft yeah. launch for next fall and then formally the following fall. So it, it was probably, it, I don't want to speak for the school council, but it was, that was kind of an opportunity to work out those kinks and kind of figure mm -hmm. out. So and you have a you're looking for a grant or for an administrator. Run. So oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So tech, so tech wise too, I think kids can self support. I think mm. technology can be a real asset. Um, but there is just a check. I mean, it is an honor system. Students have to say I did it, and yeah. they um, indicate what they did. So um, and technology can be used to clearly say what students have met it and not met it. Um, when it's set up correctly. And I think that's some of the things that they hope to work out the coming year. And you saw that it included um, seeking some grant funding to have someone sort of develop those systems and structures for it. Can I ask a question to that? Would that money carry over for the following year? I think if there was a cost associated with it, we'd, we'd allocate it in the budget um, for the coming school year. Uh, so that soft launch that you were talking about, um, so any student that enters Hingham High School next year there's no requirement. We're not going to be checking hours. Uh, the idea of the soft launch is really uh, just to get the software going. So regardless of the fact that uh, we're going to do a requirement or we're not, I, I see a general consensus in the room that we think that volunteerism is good. Uh, so what we already have ready is we've looked at what other districts do when they do have programs like this. And they have uh, you know, websites or places to go where people can find community service opportunities. Uh, so we want to launch that uh, for this upcoming school year. Um, and, you know, I think that taking that step does not necessitate um, actually doing a community service requirement. So if that's your concern, I think that making that step is not necessarily going in that direction. I think that's just a positive thing to do uh, to help connect students to these opportunities. And, you know, a lot of students who need these hours uh, to get National Honor Society or whatever they want, they want to get community service hours. Uh, I know that there's been difficulty in actually finding those opportunities. A lot of times you'll have to have, uh, you know, you'll have these students scrambling around and they don't necessarily know where to look. So that just solves a problem that exists independently of this. Now, of course, if we do go in the direction where we do have a requirement, that becomes something where it's useful for that reason too, but it's useful regardless. Um, as to the point about the uh, uh, grant funding, um, you know, what's typical in other districts is that there is an administrator year by year who is responsible for this sort of thing. Uh, as Dr. Adams alluded to, um, you know, it's usually a system where, you know, it's done electronically and, you know, it's, it's fairly simple to tell who's met a requirement and who hasn't. Um, but that person would be in charge of, you know, making sure that there were opportunities available because, of course, it's important uh, for that to happen, uh, in addition to also administering the program itself. Um, but it's, but I just want to assure you that by doing this soft launch, that does not mean that you know we're going full steam ahead and you know whatever happens uh, is going to go ahead anyway. It's just making sure that students have access to these opportunities, uh, and you know I think that that's from what I've heard here something that everybody can agree on is a positive thing. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I think, to, to Matt's point, that was sort of my concern about just even the way the agenda read and then how this was worded, that us moving forward, this I don't want that to necessarily mean, yes, we are implementing this as a graduation requirement. I think the soft launch is a good idea to see how it goes, survey students, survey parents. I am concerned about the 5 or 10% of people who this could be difficult to do, right? Everybody doesn't have access to free time, everybody doesn't have access to a car to get to a place, everybody has, some people may have social anxiety issues that they don't want to put themselves out there. So I was glad to hear that some things that you could do at home with family members would also could also count to that. Um, but all that being said, I think a, that's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out here in the soft launch. What does count? Is it fully self-reported? How do you account for someone if they did all 40 hours freshman year or they told, you know, they had a service trip plan for junior year that they could do it, like if we keep the minimums. Um, so those are the things that I'd be concerned about. I mean, I've worked in three diff different districts with this requirement and kids grad, this is not the reason kids don't graduate. Yeah. Um, they can meet this needs and the schools 
um, providing flexible, I mean, you could volunteer in the school to do something, to help mm -hmm. in the off front office. There are ways to help students who may be struggling to meet the requirements. So um, I think the soft launch will provide lots of those opportunities for the kids who may be struggling to find community service as part of their requirements. I think that clubs are a place this could also happen. It already happens in athletics and sort of documenting all the places it does happen and would be arts. an interesting, the arts yeah, are a great yeah. opportunity when you, when the students are um, performing at the veterans um, um, memorial service, I mean, that could count um, towards your community service. I think there are lots of ways that our kids are engaged, that this provides um, an opportunity for them to highlight that as part of their college, makes them more competitive. But I think that we also need to echo Ali's comment around, we often hear that our kids are, it's all about the academics and academics is key at Hingham High School. Here's a place for us to say, hey, we also value that time that you spend um, in service of others um, because that is also an important part of your learning. We learn just as much from that opportunity to engage in the community and to provide support and care um, for those who might need that additional help. Um, and I think those are important lessons for our young people that they don't necessarily get um, unless sometimes it's required of them. Um, and so this is an opportunity for them to, to, to have that chance as part of their education at Hingham High School, so. I, I, I was kind of with Michelle and, and Matt and, and my concern is um, the graduation requirement. And we have this population of students and it's probably the population of kids that you talked to Jasper who are already engaged and already doing things but there is a small population who we already have such a, a great um, requirement for graduation that it is going to be an added stress and unlike the the social emotional that Ali had pointed out that this might help them I actually think that this might harm somebody it might actually push them over the edge it's one more thing that they have to do and they have all of these things that they need to do in order to graduate that I'm concerned. So I'm wondering about the students who are struggling. Did we talk to any of them? Did we talk to any Metco students who will have to then make arrangements to get a ride because the bus may not be available? Or, you know, those are the kinds of population of people that I'm worried about, um, special ed kids. Um, again, I think kids are already doing a lot, um, so it might already be captured, but there might be a small population of kids that, that this is going to be really hard for, um, and just having that added pressure to, to try to get graduation requirements um, might just be that added stress where we've got a mental health crisis going on right now, and I, I don't want to go the other way. I don't want to push somebody over the edge. And I can certainly speak to some of those things. We, did, we do actually have a Metco student who serves on the school council, um, and you know we've definitely got uh, we've had valuable feedback from all sorts of students, so I, I don't think that it was just necessarily students who are already uh, engaged in this sort of thing. Uh, also, a Metco student could complete their community service in Boston, in their home community, uh, and there's certainly a lot of uh, volunteer opportunities there. I lived there for most of my life, and I know that I uh, was able to do different things around there. Um, but in addition to that, you know, when we were talking to other districts, when we were talking both to students in other districts who have this requirement and uh, members of staff in other districts, um, the thing that we more often heard was that this was beneficial to students in their mental health. I, I failed to think of an example where we heard uh, about the opposite. You know, perhaps that's not something they wanted to talk about exactly, uh, but we did hear a lot of stories about how this was very helpful. I think that we uh, heard a story about how that was helpful uh, a little earlier, but you know, I think that that's the type of story that we hear more often, uh, not just from the people who are administering these programs, but also the students who participate uh, in these programs because they attend schools that have this sort of requirement. So hearing it from them, you know, that was something I was concerned about too. Um, but you know, I was really assured, and I was given additional confidence when I was able to hear that uh, from those students too. I'm looking at this for now, and I'd see what the concern is. <laughs> um, because we talk about the soft launch, launch, which I think we've all agreed that is great um, because it's it's a resource for students. But then it also says that if we agree in principle, the high school um, will draft new language for the inclusion of the next edition to the pro pro program of studies. 
I'm wondering if maybe we could see that in advance uh, or like kind of work with us along the way because it seems like there are some things to as you as you work on it and figure things out um, so it doesn't come down to you're presenting the program of studies and all these things are still floating out there. Absolutely. My, my assumption was that be, because the school committee approves the program of studies and, and approves the student handbook that we, we would be bringing that language to you for your subsequent approval. And um, we just want to get a sense that um, there was there was interest uh, in us taking those next steps, um, and, and you know perhaps it's perhaps it's wise to have a motion of some kind that um, says go forward with the soft launch in September, um, start the website, get it out there, and then we will reconsider, um, you know, when the language is brought for your consideration, whether a graduation requirement is is appropriate because it is it is a big decision. You know, Matt, I would certainly agree that's a, that's a big, uh, significant vote if we're adding something to the school's graduation requirements. On that soft launch, would, that, would the soft launch be considered mandatory then? No. No, okay. No, the, the vision of uh, the school council was um, to, to open the website up at the start of the school year and, uh, and make that available to all students with a, a full sense, as Jasper had just pointed out. It would be really helpful Absolutely. to lots of students uh, no doubt anyone who plans to apply to the National Honor Society, many of whom are indeed scrambling for opportunities, wondering what their options are, would go there and, and find uh, a really rich variety of opportunities. It would be a real value add for community organizations as well to have a place to promote their opportunities. And, and so all students could take advantage of that, but, but none of it would be incumbent on nobody, it would be an obligation uh, for nobody. At, at that point, but would allow us to work out some of the kinks. Um, in the meantime, we could we could probably also develop a kind of a frequently asked questions document that gets at some of the concerns that have been raised here. I, I've taken a bunch of new notes on, on some really good questions that, that were brought up here. Um, and, and those would be good topics for us in our, our next school council meetings when we pick up in the fall to, to really try to flesh this out a little bit more fully um, and, and to address those areas of concern. I guess I'd like to see, I would like to see you move toward the graduation requirement. I don't know if I just sense them. <laughs> That's just personally. Um, I, I think but people might feel better if there were more, uh, if it were more fleshed out. It's like, this is what it's going to look like. We tried this, this didn't work, that kind of thing. Right. Um, well, I think we can all get along. I, I can have a chance to speak yet. I'm no, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to speak like you like microphones. But, uh, <laughs> I think we're confusing why people sign up for a program with what people get out of it. And then in high school, we don't care why people sign up for algebra. We don't care why people sign up for orchestra. We care what they get out of it. And that's the whole point of this. I think Ness talked about, you know, kids with mental health struggles and kids who are special needs and all of this. I can tell you my, you know, my own special needs son who, um, applied, worked for a week helping a snap kid ride a bike. It was, as life-changing from as the trip to Harlan was for some people. I think we divide students into two groups. We have, it's great that we're talking about the national scholars and they're, they'll be helped by the community service requirement. I'm focused on the other half where we have kids who give help and we kids who have kids who accept help. And the special ed kids accept help and the high needs kids accept help. And it is a necessary message we give to these kids who probably wouldn't sign up for community service on their own because they're constantly told that they can't. Uh, 10 hours a year, I, what student in Hingham doesn't spend 10 times that amount of time scrolling through TikTok? Like, <laughs> I mean. My concern too is then yeah. it becomes incumbent on the parent to get them there. Like it's, it's just one more thing that the parent is mm -hmm. going to have to manage with. No, and, and I guess where I'm coming from with it is I'm I am that kid who randomly showed up for community service when I was in high school, and it was a program that worked with special needs kids on a rec program on a Saturday, and I showed up one Saturday, and then I showed up every Saturday for the four years that I was in college, and then I went and got jobs working with special needs kids. Then I became a special needs teacher, and I wouldn't be sitting at this table if I didn't do community service in high school. And I would say I did the exact same thing. Yeah. I did the exact same thing, but I, my and I think we all agree that there is a value to community mm -hmm. service. It's, I think the question on the table is, it, do we require it? Yes. Because I think we all yeah. think that it's fulfilling. I think it is more fulfilling than a lot of what happens. In the, you know, like it's, 
It is it's a life changing for a lot of kids who do it. And for the kids that don't do it, it becomes another bureaucratic requirement for graduation. And for 10 hours a year, I'm not that worried about that. One of the beauties of the website, though, I think, is that it will showcase a lot of opportunities that kids can do during school hours or that they're already doing. And that would be one request I have for you is it might not be opportunities that kids need to sign up for, but that you have things that are already existing. Like I know um, my boys both do the youth track program and probably have already fulfilled their 40 hours in the last two years doing that. And it's something they love and they got a lot out of, but they didn't have to go seek it out. And it happened during something they were already doing, but it would be great for those students to say, oh, wow, I already did 10 hours this year and it was fun. Maybe I should do more. Or even to just see, I don't have to do anything extra to do this for the kids that are struggling to find that time. All right. Uh, do you think we need a motion to, I think Rich, you've suggested that you'd like us to have a motion mm -hmm. to at least um, uh, agree to a soft launch of this without a graduation requirement and no budgetary impact in fiscal 24 mm -hmm. to the school committee? You, <laughs> there will be a financial, but we're, it will, it will not, it's not going to have the budget. I'll seek some grants. So it's just, that's right. just the uh, website, essentially. Yeah, my own, that's, that's, I guess, my question, because it's kind of like there's, to me, the website is an absolute no-brainer. I don't even know. Maybe and, we have to, well, I guess we have and to. And thank you to Katie Sutton that. for putting it together. Yeah. Like, to me, that's absolutely <laughs> no-brainer. For free. I, I'm concerned about going all the way to what the memo is saying right now. Um, but is there something in between? Like, a soft launch also could be more, you, you know, I don't know, something or more. Into graduation. Now, I don't know what yeah. the right answer is, so I guess I'm not even sure. Well, somebody wants to make a motion yeah. on what they would like to I don't see know. over the next year. Discuss it. Why a soft launch would need to be voted on? I guess that's my question. I don't either. I don't. I would not think that it does necessarily. Mm -hmm. so I think don't you need to vote on the, sorry, the stipend. No. The stipend is well, just to no say that they're seeking yeah, grant funding. Oh, great. Okay. Right. 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 Which you would need to approve if. if awarded yeah. I think more what could work is just consensus from the committee that we would support the soft launch versus actually approving something because we're not really approving it. you're yeah. not approving a stipend yeah. we're not approving mm -hmm. we're definitely not approving it being graduation requirement we're just saying yeah. all right give this pilot program get the pilot program right I totally give it a, that. As I, guess I would just say what is the so what's the next step to, I mean, is it, is it literally, uh, principal Swanson comes back with some of FAQ, you know, so this is a little bit more fleshed out and then we have a more robust discussion about it, which is I think is, it's one, the creation of the website to showcase, um, the community service that might be available in the community. I think we heard also perhaps some collection of some other data, um, collection of student voices across various groups. Um, perhaps a survey of parents and community members, the staff, and bringing you back that feedback so you can hear. It feels like they've done a lot of learning and they're supportive of it. Mm -hmm. And so you might benefit from sh them sharing some of what they've learned. What are the communities that um, already require community service? What's the data look like um, uh, across the, the, the towns in the South Shore? Um, how do they code? So some of the learning that they did, I think you all, we would all benefit from sharing in an open forum um, so that we could learn more of some of the benefits um, and also some of the cons that they sort of explored. So I think that's kind of the two next steps um, that you kind of heard overall. Um, so maybe that's the next step. But that sounds like the plan of action. There's nothing to vote on tonight. Um, but more work for you to do. <laughs> but yes, more work. And I think there will be lots of questions and people will want to understand, um, you know, the implications, good and bad. Thank you for all of your work. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And honestly, to Katie Sutton for, I said it before, but just for your work on that website, because I know that is a labor of love and it was um, of love because we, we were not charged for that. <laughs> so thank you. And Jasper, thank you as well. But to add to that, I, I, so Katie's donating her time and it's, it, we're, we're grateful, but if this becomes a graduation requirement in the future, that's something to consider because 
a lot of the times not-for-profits don't capture all of the actual costs to run a not-for-profit and then you get burned on the back end. And I don't want to get burned on the back end when Katie Sutton is no longer in whom I'm providing this free service to a website. Yes. Like I want to be yes, able to make sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So we want to make sure we have all of that capture. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> no. That's what you think. Thank you for agreeing to do this forever, Katie. Thank you. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next item is we've got a couple field trips. So to approve out of state field trips and act as appropriate. Um, Dr. Adams, do you want to kick it off or? Sure. We have um, two. I know Phaedra is on. Um, um, on the call um, to talk about the 9 through 12 um, music proposed trip. Hi, Phaedra. Do you want to talk briefly about the trip? I'm sorry, Phaedra. Sorry, Phaedra. <laughs> you weren't expecting this much conversation tonight. <laughs> you need to. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, thanks for putting our trip on the agenda tonight. Every year, the Vandenberg students at King of High School. Uh, in grades nine through 12 are invited to uh, participate in a, in a weekend walk, usually about a three night trip somewhere domestically. Um, it's an incredible experience every year. It's my favorite weekend of the year. I think a lot of students would say the same. Um, the community building that comes out of this singular weekend is, is really remarkable and it, and it helps sort of fuel uh, the connections that are already set up with, within our program and our ensembles. So we go to a different location every year so that students at the high school don't repeat the same destination twice over their four years with us. Um, some students go all four years, some students go one or you know a couple of years, sort of depending on their other plans and everything. Uh, this past school year, we went to New York City, saw a number of tremendous performances there, um, New York Philharmonic, and we went to Juilliard School for some recitals, things like that. Next year, we're scheduled to go to Orlando to Disney World uh, it's the trip we've run three or four times before, uh, Brian and myself, Brian Pintada and myself. Um, we have the students bring instruments with them. Uh, the smaller instruments get checked, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, brought onto the plane, those overhead luggage. We rent the larger instruments down there, and then the students are able to participate in a really lengthy and really focused, very rewarding workshop that's led by the Disney music people. Um, and that experience is really special and it's very unique because we all get to do it together. Uh, we've taken 100 students to Disney before, we've taken 50 students to Disney before, and each time they're able to accommodate our mixed levels, mixed grade levels, mixed instrumentation uh, in this workshop. And it's, it's really a lot of fun. Brian and myself get to play in it as well. So it's a, it's a unique trip uh, for us and for our students, and we're going to be traveling uh, upon approval the first weekend of April, Thursday, the first Thursday until Sunday of April. Um, it's, it's a flight trip once again. And yeah, we, we're really looking forward to it. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd love to see you. So. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions? I just have a comment. You already have two that are going to sign up as soon as this is approved. So <laughs> just letting you know. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can I said, you're, you have two that are already planning to sign up as soon as this is approved, coming from my house, so thank you. Ready for a motion? Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll make, a, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, Hingham Public Schools field tr overnight field trip to um, Orlando, Florida, April 4th, 2024 through April 7th, 2024. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, you're all set. Thank you for hanging with us. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so we've got um, a second trip, um, uh, eighth grade French class. Yep, we have Mr. Smith on, on the call as well and to share about an eighth grade French trip um, to Quebec. Mute. There you go. There you go. How are you all? Thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, uh, yeah, I'm here uh, to speak to you about our grade eight trip to Quebec for students who are enrolled in French uh, as eighth graders. 
This had been a long-standing uh, tradition at Hingham Middle School, and we stepped away from it, um, as with most things, uh, with the pandemic, and we're looking to bring this trip back. It's open to all students who are enrolled in French as eighth graders. It takes place uh, in the early part of March, March 7th through the 10th. So students be uh, traveling, missing two instructional days, returning on a Sunday evening. They travel by bus to Quebec. They learn about the history and culture of Quebec, um, and they get to practice their, their speaking and listening of uh, the French language while there. It's an awesome trip. I had the uh, pleasure chaperoning it once many years ago. Um, the kids get an awful lot out of it. There's really no substitute for actually practicing a foreign language in this manner, um, but also to learn about the culture and, and experience this type of travel. It, it's, a, it's a real treat for the kids. Um, the chaperone's done a wonderful uh, time getting to know students in a different way in a different venue, um, and we just find it a very rewarding and enriching experience. Great. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? No, I just wanted to note on this one and also the previous one that there are scholarships available for students who need it, so they can apply for that, and that's available. So it's, it's on the form, but it doesn't say. So. Thank you, Carrie. Yes, there are scholarships available, and there is travel insurance uh, available to families who wish to uh, avail themselves of that option. Um, and while the travel company uh, offers some financial aid, we are going to seek uh, additional scholarships to make this available to as many students as possible. Thank you. Does it, do we know what they'll be doing? I mean, it's a, it's very general on the form about they'll learn about the history and culture and order food, but it doesn't really have an itinerary or what they'll be doing. Did you see the bread lady? My, so my, There's a whole thing that I missed. I'm sorry, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I yeah. saw, Again? I, I saw, sorry, I go, go to page three of the document <laughs> if you have my I question. On the yeah. and bread. It's, it's like yeah. the most detailed <laughs> itinerary in the world. <laughs> I, will, I, will I apologize. Just, I will just comment that I'm glad to see that this trip has come back. Yes. My <laughs> son was on it the last time. Uh, well, the went. Went. Oh, um, oh So I'm glad to see it's back. <laughs> Jenny was saying she's <laughs> glad to see it back. Not sure if you can hear us. No, no, no. Can. all right, he can't hear us. Well, we'll make a motion. Okay, yeah, all right. All right, um, <laughs> moving on. Make a motion <laughs> to approve the fabulous field trip um, to Quebec um, March 7th, 2020, March 7th through March 10th of 2024. I will second. Any further discussion? No, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, you're all set. I wonder if anybody else we are. Yeah, I we are. Um, <laughs> I think that's fine. Um, can, can we just test to see if anybody else can hear us on Zoom? Um, Let's just restart the. <laughs> yes, we'll start. Should we go back to three? Go to go back to the beginning. Raise a hand if you can yeah, hear us. Possibly, Mary Eastwood, can you hear us? Yeah, no. Okay, I don't want to call on somebody that might have to get their camera in. Or it looks like there is audio because you can it see it up there. there. Is, uh, All right. Saying. Yeah. The first two hours. <laughs> Maybe they did. And the owls are on. So. All right. Okay. All right. We'll continue. Um, all right. So the next few are related to policy. We've got a new policy chair who will take us through the first three. So to review policy AD, the mission statement, um, this is a first read. So Allie, if you could take us through it. Sure. Um, yeah, we have three policies. The first two are just the first read. Um, AD is our mission statement. And when we updated the strategic plan, we had a new mission statement. So you guys have it in your pocket to read through, but it basically just replaces the old mission statement with the new one, along with our theory of action, all just picked up from the strategic plan. Okay, great. Anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, the next one is to review policy DJE procurement requir requirements. First read. Yes. So same thing, first read, and then we will bring it back next, um, next meeting. But this one was a request just to update the numbers, um, the ranges, so in excess of $100,000 will now be, or we're looking to have it be based on a competitive bidding. And then the second bullet point there to change the range between 10,000 and 100,000, it was 50 before. So it just updates the language within that. So Aisha, if you have any other 
comments on that? No, thank you. Was that a change, <laughs> yes. 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 So a, a change in procurement? Yes, legislation. Procurement laws that impact only the um, school districts throughout the Commonwealth. It will also be helpful because um, a lot of because of the increase in prices and everything else, it will definitely help in terms of how much time and efficiency we have, can put towards um, procurement as mm -hmm. well. So thank you. Yeah. And really, the language didn't change except for um, swapping the fifty thousand and bringing it up to one hundred thousand. Okay. Thank you. Anybody? Any questions? Further discussion? No. Okay. Um, next item seven point eight to review a memorandum of understanding. No, 7. Oh no, 7. you're right. Seven point seven to review policy, policy EBCS yeah. <laughs> interim HPS general policy on COVID related requirements and act as appropriate. Can I make this motion? Yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'm just jumping out of my seat. So I'll let them fight it out. I heard it. Yes. And this one we um, we did not like to make any changes. We we're, 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 we're,
Does this live for a specific amount of time period, or is this ongoing and we can adjust it as we see Well, so? it'll be reviewed annually and you right. change it. And if, if any board decides they want to change something. Okay. Change it, I didn't know if this was the MOU for the fiscal year. Well, no. It's 24, just, it's, it's just. Yeah, oh, okay. but it's approved and then annually. We'll okay. Kind of. Yeah. And one thing that we said at the beginning was just it's more of a communication to between yeah. the different boards and groups as well. Mm -hmm. And we plan to read throughout the year as well, too. So, for example, even as we go through the budget season, if there are any changes that are coming up throughout the budget season, then the, the, the MO, MOU can also be tweaked based on those outcomes as well. Right. And okay. one of the things, like, so one example is as we were kind of working on all of this during COVID, the um, the tennis courts, that was brought up to us by the rec commission, but it wasn't really on the school committee's radar at all. Mm -hmm. And we did that, and then we started, you know, we brought that to town meeting, and it was, we wouldn't, I mean, it, it went smoothly because we talked about it, and then it turned out they were also doing the, the street hockey court in the back, too, and so we could put those projects together, and again, if we weren't talking, we wouldn't know, so, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Michelle? I do just have one. Okay. Um, just on the, the fees. So the rec collects the fees, but we still pay them the 41200 In addition to that. In addition to that. And do we, um, um, I guess we'll, we can look at it every year, but because it says in the future years we'll transfer mutually agreed upon, do we think that's going to be more or less than what we're giving them now? I think it, it will depend on it goes. The select board has a similar. Um, language in there and i think it depends on that's what the mutually agreed upon language is but we can't bind future school committees right right um or nor that can can they buy future select boards i think that amount based on yeah you know? i just i can't why do we have to why yeah. why because they're getting, getting the fees and we're not allowed to collect fees what one why do we contribute to 41 to i mean i, I get so, we use so, that so what they, what but they, two where's the money coming from right so what they did what they do as part of the field maintenance project is that they have um, um, hired a, a, construct, a contractor mm -hmm. that comes in and does all the fees. And from the budget that they provided to us, it comes to 200 and something thousand dollars a year to be able to maintain all the fees. And based on how much they collect from all the fees, including our fees as well, um, they needed to get an extra amount to be able to help subsidize the cost of the, the um, the field maintenance. Got it. And I think when it was first looked at, we found that um, in terms of how much we were spending ourselves on the maintenance of the field is, is a savings right. for us, right. even considering the fact that the fields are doing so much better under their care. Okay. So this is kind of our user fee. So the exactly. school department is paying the user exactly. fee to use the field. Exactly. Okay. To maintain the field. To maintain, to maintain, yeah, the, maintain the field. Yeah, to maintain the Yes. So we we're also collecting the fees then. But we mm -hmm. continue to, so for example, where, the, where, we, where our custodians may be um, 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 utilized or, or helping or working a, a shift to, for example, for um, a football game or whatever um, kind of activity, we determine what fees um, our custodians get, get paid and they get paid for those um, services that they provide as well. So any, uh, any additional fees that are that we, um, outside of the field maintenance itself, that we have, or costs that we have, these are reimbursed to us as part of um, whatever group or rental that, that, that exists. So Got what it. fund would, would the 41,000 come out of ours if we were to come from out of the athletics department? So we have it budgeted for as well, okay. so it will come out of our budget, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's included in the budget this year? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. In the operating, out of what, what category? Out of out of the um the, the fields, the athletic fields and within the operating budget. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So first read. We're gonna bring this back. Yep. Um, at our next meeting. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Okay. Seven point nine to discuss student parking fees at the high school and act as appropriate. I'm not sure who's taking this through. Dr. Adams, yep, I know so. uh, Mr. Swanson is still here. He spoke about this fee at the last meeting. Um, so this just memorializes it and asks you to take a vote um, upon the fee. And I think Aisha was going to share um, where the fee um, would, how it would be collected and um, used. Right. In terms of that aspect of it, from our discussions as well, um, we, we, Propose that the fee will be um, collected 
through, through Unipay, the way all of our other fees are collected right now. So that will be done on the, on the website. We have the Unipay um, as our vendor that we use to help us collect the fees, and it'll be deposited in one of our, our building use revolving accounts. And that account will be used to um, maintain the um, parking lots, the stripes, and anything else that's needed in terms of the parking itself. Okay. I saw that there were slots already numbered, so that was nice. And, <laughs> and we do, sorry, no, go ahead. Um, and we do have adequate parking for staff, even with these changes. Just knowing somebody at this table who uh, they, they neglected <laughs> to think of the staff parking at their school. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions? Somebody want to make a motion? Uh, I will make a motion to discuss. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I did have one question. Um, do, I think we were, where was this funded to? It was originally being collected, it sounds like, at the high school, but it's now going to go through a revolving fund, mm -hmm. which is what um, Aisha was saying that it's going to go through Unipay and go through the same similar process as the um, athletic fees are collected. Okay. All right. Well, not, not, sorry. not in the athletic fee yes, revolving fund, correct, process. but the same yes. process. Yes. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Building, building, use, building, use, building use at that building, building use, use account. account. Building use account. All right. Uh, all right. So I'll make a motion to approve the new parking fee structure at Hingham High School to be funded to the building use account. I have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I'll start. Um, Seven point ten to discuss change order for tennis court project at Hingham High School and act as appropriate. Um, so Dr. Adams and Aisha. So in terms of the, um, the tennis court project, there um, is a change order for $2,000. Um, that is, um, we, in terms of that, it is to hire um, a construction, a licensed construction um, technician to be able to um, look at those, um, the tennis court, the tennis courts, and um, what, this is a requirement that, that came, about, came, up, came about because of the, um, the building commissioner. He had required that in order to get the, in order for the permits to be passed. Um, Mark Thorell and Katie also looked and called other, as well as the, um, the project project manager called other um, called other technicians as well. And we found out that this particular. Um, um, technician was the, uh, the cheapest or lowest cost with the license that we that is required. Um, so we ask that you vote on or approve that change order for that to be able to continue, that process to continue. And just to remind everybody, so this is something that went to town meeting um, and came to us as well. So we, we had, um, through the athletics revolving a fund, we had approved $300,000 being used to fund the tennis courts um, and street hockey, which they kind of went together, the two projects went together. Um, and in the town meeting, the town approved 864,000. So they went out to bid. We voted on that bid um, with Cape and Island Corporation back in March. Um, so this is just a change order for that. Because it was a change in the original contract, we thought you all needed to approve the change right. order. Any questions? Somebody want to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve a change order in the amount of $2,000 for the Hingham High School Tennis Corps project to ensure a construction supervisor's licensed person uh, can be hired to assist with the required permitting to continue the project. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, all right, 7.11 to review rental agreements for Traces um, Hingham High School program and act as appropriate. So Dr. Adams, I'm not sure if you wanna kick this off or if Aisha's taking us through. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of this um, this year, um, as early as probably, was it November? Mm -hmm. um, as part of our tours around the district, um, one of the things that Dr. Adams and I tried to do was we started looking at other alternatives for um, for traces within Hingham. Um, and in terms of our um, tours and reviews and discussions, um, we had we found many different ideas of alternatives that could be used, but in terms of the costs that would be um, that we'd have to put in 
to get them into uh, into the uh, into uh, into get, uh, get them into get them ready for the students to be able to use it and for the uh, at a cost that would be reasonable. Um, we didn't weren't able to find anything that at the current moment is ready for those students to come in. For example, we looked at possibility of the Cushing Street building um, sharing the space with the rowing team, um, but a lot of construction would be required in terms of heating and other things that would be needed. Um, we, we had discussions with others about um, coming up in the next few years, probably even looking at the fire department, but then even with that, they would need a new sprinkler system and other, 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 and the costs in terms of that would be very high. So at this point in time, we think the best alternative is to continue with the current rental. Um, we put the, 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 um, the rental out to bid um, earlier this year and um, we only got one response and the only response we got was a current uh, um, um, landlord mm -hmm. who responded to our bid, was advertised in the paper and everything else. Um, and the price is reasonable in terms of the increases and what it, it entails. So we ask that you please approve um, the use of the building and the lease for the coming year as well. Okay. Any questions? No. Just a comment. I, I mean, I appreciate the work that went into trying to find a spot for this because we've been trying to do this for, we're going into year four now because it's right. happened in 2020. Um, so I think that's just at some point very soon we need to come up with a longer term plan for what we're going to do with our not only traces but sort of vocational technology in in general so um i think something to think about for maybe to put on an agenda for future meetings but discuss some options ideas and how to do that so yeah that's what you get from the town yeah mm -hmm. and one of the things that we sorry yeah i mean we, we looked at all the spaces yeah. that were suggested yeah. and with um Katie Sinclair and just the amount of work needed to bring those spaces mm -hmm. up to code. Um, it, it just, we're, we were up into the million dollar range mm -hmm. and it just did not seem feasible um, in the in the short term and long term to go that route right now. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things we even did was we spoke to the, um, the town administrator and he contacted other people who had rental property in town as mm -hmm. well. Yes. to see if there's anybody who had the space that we needed and type of space that we needed. Um, we looked into it for us, but there wasn't anything that would meet our needs. So. I heard that Bath & Beyond just became available. I beg your pardon? <laughs> that Bath & Beyond just became available. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Doing it. Make All right. Um, I will make a motion to approve the rental agreement for Trace's Hingham High School program. Um, as outlined in the contract. I will second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, all set. Um, okay, so 7.12 to accept grants and donations and act as appropriate. I believe there are two grants to talk about tonight. I know Andy's still here if he wants to speak to us, his you. grant since you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying. Yes. Uh, so as the, the memo outlines in your packet, uh, this is another uh, DESE funded grant. Uh, I think we're now five for five on these for uh, all the social studies and financial literacy ones over the past uh, year or so. So we're excited about this one. This funds um, professional development for a, a new free open source curriculum for um, for grade five social studies. It was uh, developed by DESC, primary source, and some other scholars. And while the curriculum itself is free and open source, it does require pretty robust professional development. So this grant uh, will fund that. Um, I submitted a grant for uh, a little over $17,000 uh, for what was a pretty robust professional development plan over next year and then pending funding um, into 24-25 school year as well. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions if you had it, but uh, it's all good news. Thank you for continuing yeah. to do that work on the yes. grants. Yeah, yeah. we've been really lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions? That was awesome. Yeah. Anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to um, accept the grant uh, from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for the in 
Investigating History Implementation Grant in the amount of $17,137. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yes. Um, and then a second grant from HEF. Right. So we have a total of six grants from um, um, HEF um, for $45,799.93. Um, these are, again, we have a few social studies ones in there too. <laughs> and um, also, um, Ms. Katie Roberts also had a, a few um, summer workshops included in here. Um, I, I think HEF will probably have a few more grants that we will be seeing before the year is over, but these were the summer ones that we got wanted to get approval for ahead of time just because um, they'll be getting, you'll be working on them this summer as well. So we just ask for your approval on those grants, please. Yeah, and so the um, Hingham Education Foundation, I don't know, Tim, you want to share. I, they had put out a blurb. Uh, but I don't want to steal any just, I mean, that's, that's, their, that's uh, there now. That's there now, but uh, they've just been an absolutely incredible and valuable partner for Hingham Public Schools. So thank you so much to have yes. all the work that they do. Just, um, so they, they announced that they awarded over $100,000 to fund 21 grants that will positively impact students across the six schools. Um, they raised funds this year through the elementary school spelling bee, the fall and spring events, the HEF annual campaign and the um, Feel Good High Five initiative. So, and just to a lot of great work. And just to connect the dots, the, the $21,000 grant was connected to the technology plan to help further technology integration at the secondary level. And the second one um, connects to the professional development as well as the equity um, audit as well to further inclusive practices for and specifically our students with special needs. And so I, I just making that connection of um, and grateful to the Hanging Ed Foundation for their support of the strategic plan um, in our efforts to move the district forward. And I figured I'd come back here just to add my public thanks yes. to have uh, since uh, as Aisha mentioned for those will uh, really positively impact our social studies curriculum and program. So thank you. Mm -hmm. to have. Yeah. yeah, they're amazing. All right. We want to make a motion. I'll make a motion. Um, I will make a motion to accept a grant from the Hingham Educate grants from the Hingham Educational Foundation uh, for the fiscal year 23-24, totaling forty-five thousand seven hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety-three cents. I think it's probably worth saying what they're for. Um, to fund Grade Six Twelve Technology Integration Fellows, Inclusive Practices Summer Workshop, Secondary School Studies Professional Development. Grade five social studies professional development, content area literature for K through five social studies, and student led civics showcase. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Right along. I'm stretch. Almost there. We're flying in the first five minutes of the meeting. Um, all right, seven point thirteen. Declare items as surplus and act as appropriate. I assume Aisha will be taking us through this. Yes. So we have. Um, <laughs> so we have the books from the, the east and south libraries. They've been doing some reading of the libraries. Um, the copy machines, Rico machines, um, at the Middle Central and High School that have been a little bit older and not functional. So we've been looking to replace those. And um, so a few French textbooks from the World Language Department. Um, these have all, we provided a list of those items. Um, we just ask that you approve. Um, then, so we can um, discard of them and to the least cost to Hingham. Okay, great. Great. So you want to make a motion? <laughs> I'll make a motion to declare as surplus RICO multi-purpose copy machines from the middle school, high school, and central offices listed in our in this memo. I'm not going to read them all. And to authorize the director of business and support services to dispose of them at the least cost to Hingham. I have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'll make sorry one more. And I'll make a motion to declare as surplus library books from the South and East School listed in the memo, and to authorize the library coordinator to dispose of them at the least cost to Hingham. I will second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Those are all set. Mm -hmm. All of us over here making sure that we didn't have books that were declared. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all the South people, right? <laughs> well, I'm guilty apparently. <laughs> 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 
Um, okay, bye bye. <laughs> for the public, we get the the detail in there. Our names on there. So. <laughs> Um, okay, 7.14 to discuss pay rates and district-wide per diem rates and act as appropriate. So back over to Aisha. So um, what I've done is just listed um, some of those rates and um, for this year. Um, some of the things that I'm happy to kind of report on even on a side note, uh, um, for example, the driver's ed program, we're continuing to see the program growing. Um, not as, I mean, small leaps and small leaps um, I'm getting back on its feet again, so we're asking to just get a small increase so that we can um, pay those people who are part of that program as well, because they haven't seen an increase for the last three years. Um, and then just looking at the food service substitutes and other substitutes as well, just to um, get your approval on those rates, please. Anybody have as any well questions? as the KIA, KIA rates as well. No. Anybody want to make a motion? Um, yes, I will make a motion to approve the pay rates and district-wide per diem rates um, as outlined in the information provided by Director of Business and Support Services. Thank you. I will second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Sweet. Okay, so um, we are done with new business for today. Ooh. 14 items. Um, all right, so next is item eight, subcommittee and project reports. Um, Matt, yeah. Allie? Um, yep, there's some quick updates. We had an awesome meeting last week. That's uh, all of that work tonight <laughs> for all the details. And then we have a climate action meeting next week. Hopefully, I've been saying it for months, but hopefully that'll be the final meeting um, of working on the plan, and then it will go into executing the plan. And Hingham Arts has a board meeting next week. And okay. uh, I've got nothing. Terry? All right, so we've got a last meeting salary negotiations met on July 7th, and then with the full school committee today before this meeting. Um, we have a meeting scheduled on July 25th with Unit B, which are the paraprofessionals. Um, we also have a meeting scheduled with Unit A, which is the teachers, and Unit B at the end of August, both of them. Um, and we are working to schedule meetings with Unit D, which is a new unit, it's the administrative assistance and also the bus drivers have reached out. So we'll be scheduling meetings to start talking to them about their contracts too. Great, thank you. Um, I Jen. just, uh, there are warrants in the packet. Okay, great. Uh, Michelle? I do not have anything. I have nothing as well. So uh, any other items, uh, item nine, uh, any other items under 48 hours? Nope. Okay, item 10. Does anyone I want to make, make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I don't second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Cool.